Welcome to episode 39 of Talking Prisoner. Another huge guest with us today. A guest appeared in 35 episodes of Prisoner and was, and was in one of the major cliffhangers of all times. Our guest has also appeared in other Australian classic TV shows and movies such as Seven Little Australians, The Evil Touch, The Outsiders, The Sullivans, The Young Doctors, Chopper Squad, Case for the Defence, Skyways, Kathy's Child, The Journalists, The Restless Years, Cop Shop, Sporting Chance, Bellamy, Sons and Daughters, Rafferty's Rules, The Harp in the South, Fields of Fire, Poor Man's Orange, Fragments of War, The Story of Damon pra Damien Pereira, E Street, The Flying Doctors, Big Ideas, A Country Practice, GP, Janus, Police Rescue, Heartbreak High, Children's Hospital, Fireflies, All Saints and Blood Brothers. She's also very well known for her role as a headmistress as Judith Aykroyd in Home and Away from 1999 to 2000. And there is more. She's also got stage credits, which include Something for Every Man, Sisters, There and Back, Speed the Plow, and Mum's the Word. We're, of course, talking about Anna Ruby. Welcome to Talking Prisoner. And good morning, Ken. Good morning. Thank you. I have to Thank catch my breath much. now. Is there a show I that you haven't been on? <laughs> just listening to that and so oh my goodness how did I do all that <laughs> yeah, where'd, where'd you find the time I mean you've been on every tv show in Australia I well I'm pretty old so <laughs> <laughs> um now thanks for joining us I know all the fans are going to want to hear about Prisoner and Patty Lawson who of course you played but we will get to that soon um we'd like to learn about your life growing up as a child if that's okay yeah, well, I grew up in a, a suburb of Sydney called La Perouse, um, and I had a, a, I'm, I'm the middle child of an older sister, younger brother, a, a, a mum and a dad, and everybody was involved in the entertainment industry in one way or another. Um, my mum was the worst housekeeper in the world, but the best mother. Like, we, we, she just played with us all day, and I, I really feel very grateful for my childhood. I had a wonderful time and very very close family still very close to my siblings my mum passed a few years away a few years ago of course but um and, and my dad many years before that but uh, we're still very very close siblings and uh yeah I was very mm. lucky to have such a fabulous family cousins aunties uncles all, all marvelous when, when, when you say a bad housekeeper what do you what do you mean by that I mean well do you know my husband is an OCD housekeeper like he he does all the cleaning because I never learned how to do it because my mother barely knew how to wash a dish she was quite a good cook but she yeah. wasn't good at washing up after the cooking and she she was just always doing much more interesting things like housework just didn't interest her so I don't know if I married my husband out of uh I don't know if that was one of the appealing things because I quite like the idea of living in a clean house but I, I had no idea how to do it so so now, you know, I've been married for a very long time. And in fact, I met my husband just, just prior in Sydney, about three weeks before I had to fly to Sydney, uh, to Melbourne to start filming Prisoner. Oh, really? And uh, yeah, so uh, it was, uh, it was a good, a good test. But I always joke that the, one of the reasons that the marriage has lasted so well is that he does do <clears throat> all the housework, all the housework. <laughs> so, so, I mean, you know, I don't think I'm going to find another one like that. So I'm hanging on to him because I don't know how to do it. <laughs> now, just before we do start, on your husband, now you're married to a very famous country and Western singer. Can you um, tell yes, us about him? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, uh, he's, he's probably not very famous, although he is award-winning. He's won, he's won um, you know, several Golden Guitar Awards and, uh, and Mo Awards over here with his... He had a, a band in the country music field. Uh, in the 90s called The Wheel and they were a very popular band here so um, so that they did very well and he's only recently though it's funny because he's literally just turned 70 and he never intended to make another album his last album was he made about a decade ago but then COVID happened and we were just at home with nothing to do and a, a wonderful friend of his um said oh look you you know he's got this friend rod mccormack is a wonderful musician and used to be in the wheel with him beautiful guitar player and a wonderful producer had this gorgeous studio and he said to kim look if you've got nothing to do have you got any old songs that you wanted to record just for fun and kim said oh yeah he had these old few old songs and he went down and recorded them and they found sounded so fantastic that was so great 
that uh, that Rod said, have you got any more? And so he went down and did a few more and, he, and then he said, you know, two more and we'll have an album. So, um, <clears throat> so he ended up recording all these songs and he really, uh, I mean, it, it always sounds so unconvincing coming from his wife, but he's a, a really great songwriter and, and a beautiful singer. And, and this album, every, all his musician friends and all his fans are saying, oh my goodness, like your voice is sounding better than ever. And I, I think you heard a bit of a clip. Did, did you hear it? Yeah, I, watched, I actually watched some this morning on YouTube and uh, yeah. Yeah, amazing. and so you know, he's he is a really great singer, isn't he? And, yeah. and kind of like, a, like he's 70, which is just bizarre that he's so cool because everybody <laughs> thinks he's just this really cool guy. So I'm, so I'm married to this really cool old septuagenarian, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, and he's just been nominated for an award. This album <clears throat> was nominated. <clears throat> Excuse me. This nomina this uh, album was nominated for an award at the uh, Golden Guitars. We're off to Tamworth wow. in a week or so. So fingers crossed, he'll he'll win win a win an award. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, and just for the overseas fans, the Tamworth Musical Festival is a big. Yeah, it's festival. it's the major country music festival <laughs> yeah. in Australia. So it's yeah. So a Golden Guitar is is a. Is a big deal over over here in the yeah. in the rural areas and the country music uh, scene in Australia. The, the, his album, interestingly, he's got such an eclectic sort of array of, of songs. But uh, he's actually been nominated in the bluegrass category, which he feels a little embarrassed about because he's got so many friends who are wonderful bluegrass musicians and and songwriters, and he feels a little bit like he's you know, I'm not really bluegrass, and so I think if he wins, he's going to apologise to all the other <laughs> nominees. But we'll see. He, you know, you never know with these things. So yeah, wow. yeah but he's he's more sort of I don't know, sort of roots music, I suppose people describe it as roots or blues, a little bit countryish. You know, kind of cool country rather than rather than slim dusty who or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And just before Ken asks his question, just one more thing. That that song that you sent me the link to um, about the war, uh, that, oh, was, yes. that was brilliant. What what inspired that? Well, that, that was around the time, really, it was, the, the, <laughs> the film clip is very, um, is very disturbing, I suppose, in a lot of ways, uh, like a lot of disturbing war imagery, because yeah. it is an anti-war song. And it was a, it, it was in 2013, I think, around the time that Syria was being invaded by, by uh, America and us. And um, and it was, I mean, really, my husband's very cynical about all politicians on all sides of politics, and uh, so it was just a bit of a, a bit of a, a song about can't we do it better? You know, like do, do we have to keep fighting? And of course, we are once again in a in a nasty old war now so seems like things don't change as much as we like them to yeah mm. that's right tell us um tell us about your school days favorite <laughs> subject worst subject uh, How did you yeah well i was i was pretty good at school I, I, when i was younger I, I i was quite a keen student and uh, english was always my favorite subject um because i liked reading i liked writing i liked drama so um english was always the, my strongest subject um maths was always my poorest subject uh, my husband and i are both terrible at maths and our daughter is really good at it we can't i think it skipped a generation my dad was a pretty good at maths and so she, we were always baffled by how good she was at maths, uh, still is. So, um, yeah, I, uh, but I, I did lose interest a bit in school as time went on, as I was getting more acting work. And, um, and I'd started acting so young. I, I, I started, you know, my first job, I was only uh, just turned nine years old in, um, in 1969. No, no, no like late 1968 was when I did wow. started my first job. And um, uh, no, it wasn't, it must've been 60, was it 68? <clears throat> Around 68, 69, I can't quite remember, but I was very young. And uh, so, and I did, you know, acting work all through my teens, bits and pieces. And, um, and so by the time I was 17, I knew I was going to be an actress. I'd, I already had a, a, a good CV, you know? So, 
so that was that was my my aim and my my goal and that's just what I was going to do so um I think there was a question I I I, I read there about mentioning that I did actually get to end up getting expelled from school and I was such a good girl like I was actually very I was not a rebel at all but I did get expelled from school and th and that was because I was working on the young doctors at the time and it was taking up quite a bit of my time and and so I was missing quite a lot of school I'd be at school for two days out of five in a week and the headmaster got me in the office and said well you know it's your HSC year you can't be doing this um you'll have to you'll have to stop all that and, and concentrate on your schoolwork and and I said well actually I'm going to be an actress and and this is what I'm doing and so no I I won't do that like I, I'm that would be a foolish decision for me and uh and he said well well you'll have to make a choice and I said well I actually did swear at him but I won't do that <laughs> and 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 he and so he literally handed me a, a sheet of paper a pile of papers and says and said oh please go around to all your teachers get them to sign these forms bring them back to the office and leave the premises wow. and that was that was it so so yeah that was um that was a bit dramatic and uh so then wow. I was out on my own 17 out there starting my proper grown-up life so back in those days I mean I know now they have um you know teachers and things on set for, for kids that are on tv shows but did they have that back in those days or it was just you miss well they did they, they did like when I was a kid and working on for instance seven seven little Australians where I was only 12 years old we had a tutor and we were doing correspondence schooling because that was a four month um sort of thing but young doctors and we were also seven little Australians we were away on location quite a bit but with young doctors it was filmed in Sydney I lived in Sydney and uh and I could get to school several days a week and I mean I, I as I said to the headmaster on that fateful day um I was quite confident that I could I could do do my schoolwork and pass my HSC and he just didn't think that that was appropriate that my attendance record wouldn't be be good enough um so I uh I just lost my train of thought there <laughs> sorry oh, about that <laughs> uh, um, what was the que where, where did that question start again? Tell oh me. no, I was talking about it. They had, uh, you know. Oh, tutors. That's tutors, right, tutors. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, young doctors. Uh, I I didn't have a tutor. I was sixteen years old by then. Sixteen, seventeen. I must have been seventeen because I was seventeen when I left school. So I must have been. I started. I started work on the young doctors when I was sixteen, but I was seventeen by the time I left. So, uh, so at that age, and because I could get to school a couple of days uh, a week. They didn't think they needed to have yeah. an, an onset tutor. Wow. Now I, I did mention to Ken a few weeks ago. We're now we're in episode thirty nine, and the question about school we ask favourite subjects and least favourite subjects. And out of the thirty nine people we've had on so far, uh, have all said English is their favourite, maths is the least favourite. But I do stand corrected because a fan did pull me up and said Lois Collender said that maths was her favourite. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> that must be an actor, an actuary kind of thing, then. Do you think? Yeah. Like, as most actors uh, cool. <laughs> lean towards the English and with the maths, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now you came from a big showbiz family. Can you tell us about your uh, about your parents, in particular your mum? Yes, yes. Well, my my mother is Australian. My dad was Czech. He came over here after the after the war, and uh, my mother was. She, she really was truly quite an incredible woman. She, um, she was an actress herself uh, for many years, worked with JC Williamson's and lots of the big theatre companies back when she was young in the, in the, in the late 40s, 50s, uh, 60s. And then in the, I started acting, as I said, in, in around 1968, 69, um, or, or professionally acting at least. And by the, in 1972, I think it was, she decided to, to open a theatrical agency. And she was actually the first agent to represent Aboriginal actors in Australia. Oh, wow. Uh, because we, in La Perouse, where we live, there was a, there's a big Aboriginal community that has lived there for thousands of years. Um, and so she was very involved with the Aboriginal community uh, and, and was an agent who went above and beyond for her artists, like, she she loved her artists and when she 
with shows like, I don't know if you remember the ABC series Rush and um, some a lot of the ABC sh uh, series around that time in the 70s were starting to feature um, Aboriginal storylines or, or, or storylines that involved um, the Aboriginal community. And so they'd always go to my mother and my mother would cast all these, you know, kids and adults and different people, but she would get up in the morning. We lived in La Perouse, which was in the southernmost tip of the eastern suburbs of Sydney. And most of these shows were filmed in Gore Hill, which was on the north shore of Sydney over the Harbour Bridge. And my mother would get up at four o'clock in the morning, go to these people's houses, they, these, these little Koori kids' houses and pick them up, bring them back to her place, give them breakfast, get them in the car and drive them to work. Like she, she would, I, I don't know of many agents who actually went that far for their, their people. And when I, when I uh, got to 15 years old and my mother said, I think you need a different agent, you shouldn't re be represented by your mother. Um, for me, I, I always say this, when people say, what, do you, what quality do you want in it from your agent? Like, what is it you want from your agent? And I, and I always say, and people laugh, but I actually mean it. I say, I want them to love me. I want them to absolutely love me. Because if they love me, then when they're talking about me and trying to sell me to somebody else, they love me. <laughs> you know, they're, they're going to say good things because that's how my mother operated. And, uh, and, so, and I have had agents who, who have loved me. Um, probably my, my agent now loves me. So that's, that's the quality that I like in an agent. So she was remarkable with that. She also started at, at the very ground level on community television here, cable television that started, she started that again, very involved in the, um, with the Aboriginal community because it was first uh, filmed from uh, the basement of these housing commission flats in oh, wow. Redfern. Redfern, which is a very Aboriginal community, you know, area of Sydney as well. And she did that up until a couple of years before she died, uh, when, when when everything, the cable te community television got shut down. Uh, and she was- That was called was, Joy's World, yeah? Joy's World, that's right. And um, yes, it was it was quite the magical place. But uh, she, she, she was very instrumental in many actors, um, many Australian actors, uh, careers, you know, people like, you know, Simon Burke, who I went to school with, was uh, she was uh, his first agent, um, and Gia Caridis, and you know, many, many, wow. many people. Rick Herbert was on her, was on her uh, books, and like look, many, many people. So um, yeah, she's, and of course, she got an Order of Australia medal for her community work because she's very, very active. You know, really gave everything away to anybody. She was an exceptional woman. Even my husband, I love, I love hearing my husband talk about her because he just adored her. And it's so great to have a husband who loved his mother-in-law. Yeah. You know, that, that, that's kind of a nice thing, yeah. What was it like getting a new agent after having your mum as an agent? Was it, was it hard? Was it tough? Because she was so good at what she did. Uh, well, no, I, I was very fortunate with my first agent. My, my, the first agent I went to when I was 15 was International Casting Service agent when Gloria Payton uh, was still the matriarch there. And she, she, was, she, she loved her artists. So she was the right uh, agent for me. And I was with ICS for many, many years. Um, and, uh, and then I... I I switched around uh, over the years. Gloria died while I was still with ICS um, and I had a series of different people, some who were, well, all who were, were, were wonderful really. But, um, uh, and in the end, I only left ICS because the agent who was looking after me at that time, I loved and she left. And so I went with her. So I kind of feel like I've never really left an agent uh, without being, I've never abandoned an, a an agent really. <laughs> I've uh, I've I've just moved along with them. I've, I'm I'm the loyal type. I'm pretty you know married for going on forty years now, and <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm, I, I I I love all my agents. I've loved all my agents, and they've loved me. Good. <laughs> Next question uh, is about what your parents thought about you being an actress, but it's, it's patently obvious that um, they promoted you. Uh, yes, they were always um, 
they were always very, very supportive. Uh, I mean, my dad was, he, he was a pianist. He was more a musician than okay. anything else. He was a jazz pianist, a really lovely jazz pianist. Um, my mum did cast him in the odd commercial every now and again. Um, but, but really he was, a, he was a golfer and a, a really good golfer and a really good piano player. So we were all sort of, we were creative family. My, my sister, uh, who's also a wonderful musician, um, piano player, but she ended up uh, being a film caterer for many years. She was a wonderful cook and so fed many, many people, including me on, on, on many shows that I worked on. And my brother, uh, who is still working in the industry, it was a focus puller camera, cameraman um he's done that for many many years uh, he also did some acting when he was young he did a he was a regular in a series called carrots which was a which had some lovely actors in it including shane courtiers and other people but uh uh but he's a very very good cameraman now he's worked on all all the major films pretty much that have been shot in australia he's i think he's just about to start work on something called nautilus um okay. on, that's been shot up in the gold coast i don't even know what that is but i think it's probably some big flashy thing isn't it because <laughs> he does you know he did all the matrix movies and the oh, wow. movies and aquaman he worked on recently and you know things like you know Moulin uh, rouge hollywood films what? yeah all, all the big all the big yeah. american that are made out here he works on yeah so, wow. so we're, we're all a bit we're all a bit creative and impractical <laughs> <laughs> you just mentioned shane porteous uh, country practice terence i mean what an amazing actor do you know him or oh, yes and beautiful man of course like yeah. lovely woman. he did a very i mean i worked with him of course a couple of times on on a country practice and and my mother did a lovely little film with him in tasmania and that they were they they got very close he's a, he's a lovely man yeah, he is. Wow. Um, spare time, if you have any. Do you have any hobbies at all? Yeah, well, now I live on a little three-acre property in Eureka. I've become a very keen gardener. I've got a beautiful garden. Um, and, and I also am a really keen cook. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a really good cook. And I've, I've become a very good uh, baker. I do a lot of baking, sourdough baking. Oh, and, and of course, I live across the road from a dairy now oh, wow. and so i get i get raw milk from the dairy and i've become a really good cheese maker i make also i make you know all the cheeses my you know blues and camemberts and grease and ricotta and feta and halloumi and I, I i love showing off my cheeses i'm a very good cheese maker so i'm a dairy maid these days yeah, but yeah cooking, cooking and gardening the classic the classic kind of things got into a lot of crocheting at one point knitting when i joined the cw I, I took took to country life like a duck to water i joined the cwa that's the country women's association for uh for the overseas uh viewers so uh yeah i've, I've embraced the country life i've been living up here for nearly 11 years now for the first seven and a half years i did commute to sydney every week i flew to sydney for two or three days work every week mostly my voiceover work now the CWS are very famous for their uh, scones. Is that right? Scones. Yes. Do you the rest of people when you join, or what, what's? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, look, this is a true story. As I said, I'm a really good baker, but scones were always a huge challenge for me. Like I never, I never could do a light scone. And I swear this is a true story. I went into Bangalore uh, to the CWA office, and I paid my membership, and I got my card, and I came home, and I thought, right, I'm making scones to celebrate best scones I ever made seriously like wow. and I thought is it just joining the CWA that they, <laughs> I mean they didn't give me the recipe I just came home with my membership made the scones they were awesome go figure well so apparently the rumor is that they, they don't give the recipe out apparently it's a big secret the recipe well, I didn't use I use the women's weekly Australian you know Australian <laughs> women's weekly cookbook recipe I didn't use the CWA recipe so I don't know I think it's just paying the membership I reckon that's it yeah <laughs> and just going on the cheese is it hard to make cheese is it is it a big process it's it's like alchemy it's like magic it's i i love it it's yes it's patience very good to teach you patience timing paying attention um they need like some of them need a lot of nurturing and wow. and, and like real patience i just did my longest cheese that i've ever made which is a really strong not for the faint-hearted gorgonzola oh, yeah. and that took months to age and i had to you know, get it out and wipe it and scrape it and turn it every couple of weeks, you know, for months. And 
it's getting like more and more scary looking and smelling like old socks as blue cheese can, but beautiful. I'm very oh. proud of it. <laughs> your place for scones and cheese, I think. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, what, that's what people do around here. Yeah. <laughs> Apart from scones and cheese, do you have a favorite food? Tomatoes. I, 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 and if I'm very specific, the tomatoes that I buy here at the farmer's market from Heather, Cooper's shoot tomatoes are, I could live on them. I sometimes just have a tomato for my lunch with a little bit of salt on it. She does all these heritage tomatoes. Um, I think the Bulgarian beefsteak is my favorite. Like I, I, I know my tomatoes. I quite like the British beefsteak, but the Bulgarian beefsteak is really, really good. I don't even I don't even try growing tomatoes because I've got I I do grow a lot of vegetables. I've got quite a good vegetable garden, but tomatoes I I tried a few times and they're just not up to scratch. I, I Cooper's shoot tomatoes. Heather, big plug for her. Awesome. Wow, sounds amazing. Any uh, uh, sorry, Ken. What's that old saying about um, wisdom is knowing that tomatoes aren't. Uh, aren't a, a fruit. Oh, uh, I thought they are a fruit. Well, there's, there's a debate about that. <laughs> they are a fruit. And, and oh. wisdom is knowing that um, you don't put them into a fruit salad. Yeah, exactly. And knowing that tomatoes are a fruit. So what was the first bit? <laughs> so, so with tomatoes are, 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 aren't a fruit. Yeah. Uh, no, are a fruit. And, um, and wisdom is knowing wisdom. not to put them in a fruit salad. Yes, yes, that's the one. Yeah. There's always a big debate about a tomato being a fruit or a vegetable everywhere you go. Yeah, it's kind of, um, well, let's see, it covers everything. That's why I love yeah. it so much. It's, it's like it can be all things to all people. Cook You're it. You're a fan of the tomato, I Ken? Sorry? <laughs> You're a fan of the tomato? I, I am a big fan of the tomato. I, th I think there are South American. No, I don't know my tomato history. I think um, they come from South America. But, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're wonderful. Yeah, yeah they are. I love them. <clears throat> they are. Now, getting off tomatoes, we're veered off. <laughs> um, do you have a favourite TV show that you like to watch? Oh, well, I, I like, to be perfectly honest, I, I haven't watched actual television for well over well over a decade now um like other like many other people these days i suppose i do do a lot of streaming um there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that i've loved what i'm watching at the moment is a show that i never saw when it came out and i'm absolutely loving it is the jennifer garner series alias i'm loving that oh, okay I'm i sure. love it yeah so uh that, that's my current favorite but i i I don't know. There's 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 been lots of good television over the years, and uh, I mean, I loved I loved the American show The Wire. I thought that was that was some mm. of my favourite television. Six Feet Under was one of my favourite series. Um, I loved on on SBS. I used to love that show called um, not Front Up. Do you remember that show Front Up, where where it was uh, the interviewer. Uh, whose name has just passed me by, Andrew Andrew L. Urban. And he just wandered around the streets talking to people. Oh, really? And, and he, was such, he was the best interviewer. And it, it was just this show that made you realise that every single person on the whole planet has a really interesting story to tell. Like, everybody's interesting if you just know how to kind of be with them, you know, sit with them and be with them and listen to them. Everybody's got a great story. I love that show. I think Margaret Pomerantz produced it. Oh wow! And um, yeah, it was a really, really, really special television. So yeah, but I, I there's lots of different things that I that I like. Yeah. That I like to use. Mm. You you've appeared in some of Australia's most popular TV shows. Um, you were in uh, Seven Little Australians playing Nell Walcott in 1973. You work with Len Teal, Ruth Cracknell, and Judy McBurney. How did yeah. you get that role, and, and what was it like being a part of that show? And, and do you have any memories of, the, of those three? That show was one of the most wonderful productions I have worked on in my whole career. It was really, really special. 
um, Ron Way directed that and he cast me in it. He also cast me in my very first ever uh, television show, which was called, it was a Channel 9 Christmas special called Hans Christian Andersen that was a whole lot of Hans Christian Andersen stories and had all these lovely British, all these, it was a BBC, or no, ITV Australian co-production, I think. Uh, and the, it had people like Patrick Weimark and Richard Deacon and these old um, sort of musical almost uh, British actors who came over here. And so, so Ron had cast me when I was eight or nine years old uh, in my very first television uh, role. And then when I was 12 years old, they were casting for Seven, seven Little oh. Australian and, um, and he cast me as Nell. And he, he, was, he was the most beautiful man. He, he only died a couple of years ago. And in fact, I hadn't seen him for many, many years, like 20, 30 years. I don't know how long since I'd seen him. And he contacted me out of the blue only less than a year before he died to tell me that he was living up, up in this region oh. and, uh, and he'd like to see me. And, and I went out to lunch with, with him and his, uh, his wife and he, he's so, so beautiful. And he was just reaching out to people in his life. He knew he, knew he was dying. And, uh, and I felt so privileged that he had reached out to me. That show was absolutely divine. Leonard Teal was wonderful. He was great with the kids. He was not, um, he was not like friendly and fun and with the kids. He, he was very much like the, the he, he sort of stayed in character with us, which was the strict father. Uh, Ruth Cracknell, even though she was so much younger at the time, was terrifying. She scared the crap out of all of us. Um, Judy McBurney was absolutely fun. I, I loved Judy. Judy was also very close to my mother. She, she was a, a oh, lovely girl because I worked with her on The Young Doctors as well, of course. Yeah. And um, she, she was be beautiful, be beautiful person. Loved her very much. Um, and and but, but that show, uh, uh, there was a, a man who worked on that show who's also passed away now, the sound recordist, whose name was Sid Butterworth. And many years later, uh, I was 12 years old when I did that show. And it was truly, truly a, a special production. Everybody, every crew member, every cast member loved working on that show. And it was a beautiful piece of television and stands up still very well today. And many years later, I, was, I, I got cast in a series called, a, a mini series called Harp in the South. And Sid Butterworth was the sound recordist on that show as well. And that production, that one and the sequel, Poor Man's Orange, were also special shows to work on. Really beautiful television, beautiful cast. Annie Thielen played my mother, won wow. many awards for that, for that role, the role she played as, as our mother. She was, she was just so divine to work with. I, I loved her like a mother brilliant woman brilliant uh but Sid Butterworth was the sound recordist and halfway through the uh the shooting of that I remember sitting down with him one day and him saying to me can you believe we got to work on another show as wonderful as Seven Little Australians that we could work on two shows that were this special and so that's how special they were Sid, Sid had worked on a million things between between yeah. the two and it was 12 to 25 for me they were busy years for me so that seven little australians was truly special television and and does stand up as well it was 1970s and it it it, it does but it does stand up as a really wonderful piece of drama uh filmed drama still today as do harp in the south and poor man's orange which yeah. i only very recently re-watched but i'll i'll get into that later because i've got some Good stories about that, okay. rewatching that. Amazing. Yeah. Now, speaking of the 70s, a show that Ken's also worked on, you played Hilda in the Sullivans. What was yes. it like being in the Sullivans? How'd you get that part? Yeah. Well, that one, um, do you know, I, I cannot even remember whether I auditioned for that part and got the role or whether I was just given the role. Because a lot of those roles, some of these roles, I was just, get, like I didn't have to audition for them because some reason but I, so I can't remember auditioning for that role 
but um, it was a, I was only in it for six or seven weeks and they, because I was, I just turned 16 before I, I went to do that. And, um, and they, and so they timed it over the, over the Christmas holidays. So, so I, I pretty much spent my Christmas holidays uh, that year filming the Sullivans. And to be honest, the, the thing I remember about it most was that it was shot in Melbourne and I lived in Sydney. And so they flew me down there at 16 years old and gave me my own apartment in Turak, this wow. beautiful apartment. A handful of money every week, all these per diems, a handful of cab charge dockets and 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 I was just 16 wow. years old in a city working on a pretty cool show um, with money to spend and on my own. I remember I remember being picked up from the airport, driven to my apartment, given a call sheet and a cab charge docket and saying, see you on Monday. Just, uh, just call it, you know, the cab will be there or whatever and just give them the docker and going into this uber cool, really lovely apartment and uh, putting the radio on. And I still remember it was Leo Sayer singing um, You Make Me Feel Like Dancing and just dancing around that apartment thinking, oh, my God, how cool is this? So that's actually, I have to admit, that is my strongest memory of the Sullivans. Uh, I, I very much remember Michael Caton who... Uh, who, although I was very young and I didn't have a lot to do with him on that show, has since become a very good friend of mine. Uh, we, we, are, we are good friends. Oh, wow. Well. And, um, and, and, of course, uh, Desmond Mangan, who, who I don't know if you know Desmond, he, he, he was the other little English evacuee. It was, um, it was Hilda and I can't remember his character's name, but, uh, but the two of us came in at the same time. And he, he was a very, he's a very interesting um, Australian <clears throat> actor producer, writer, comedian, and um, and we did a lot of hanging out together and, and chatting. I remember um, I remember being quite besotted with Andrew McFarlane, who, who is also, of course, uh, well, not for me, of course, but but uh, but is a beautiful man. And we were actually just before COVID, the year before COVID, I did a wonderful trip in Turkey with my husband. And we're Facebook friends, Andrew and I, and he was in Turkey as well. And I was I was following him around Turkey and I kept writing to him and saying, so where's the, where's the best restaurant in Istanbul? And he's saying, oh, you've got to go here and you've got to go there. And that was really fun. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. And so so that was, that, that. yeah, so the Sullivan's was lovely, but it was, for me, it was like, wow. In fact, I tell you, do, do you know Max Phipps? Is, do, you, do you know who Max Phipps is? He, he's, he's a wonderful, he was a wonderful Australian actor, died far too young, played played Gough Whitlam in the, the series here, oh. uh, the, the Dismissal, the, the miniseries The Dismissal, Max Phipps played Gough Whitlam. But he also played Frankenfurter in the Rocky Horror Show in Melbourne for ages. And he was the only person I knew in, uh, in Melbourne when I went down to do The Sullivans. And I would go and see the Rocky Horror Picture, the, the, the Rocky Horror Show every night, oh. <laughs> every single night. I could quote, the Rocky Horror Show, the whole script, every 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 lyric of every song. I just knew that show inside out and backwards, and I just adored Max. He was like he was my mentor, my my friend, my he, he was quite a wonderful man. So I I, I was very lucky uh, lucky to have him there as well. So really, to be perfectly honest, my strongest memories of working on the Sullivans were being in Melbourne as a sixteen year old on my own. Yes. With, with, with uh, you know, and 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 my friends uh, BJ and Fabian, uh, uh, hanging out with them. Uh, the three of us were just Max lovers, and we'd just go to the show together every night. And they're, they're actually, I confess, my strongest memories. Oh. From that and just for the for the overseas fans, Turak is like one of the most prestige, yes, <laughs> suburbs of Melbourne. Did they put you up in Turak as well, Ken? Or <laughs> no, Fitzroy was more well, a Fitzroy Tally Theatre. Did, uh, did the Rocky Horror Show was that coming out of the Fitzroy Tally Theatre at, at that stage? I'm trying to remember. No, no, I don't think it was. It was, it, it, but it could have been. I, oh gosh, when my friend Fabian, if he ever watches this, which he well may do, um, <laughs> he'll be appalled that I've forgotten the name of the theatre, oh. and we'll write it in the comments afterwards if you have that somewhere. So yeah. I'll, I'll, I should Google it while I'm while I'm here. <laughs> anyway what's the next question while well, i google that <laughs> <laughs> yeah no I, I cut my teeth on on television working out of the fitzroy tally theater back in the 1960s 
uh, that's why I asked you. Um, was, now, was it moving really on. Old I, oh, sorry, was it yeah. a really old, old, dusty old yes. theater? Yes, yes. It probably was then, yeah. yeah. You, you is played, still, uh, is it still there, Ken, the, the theater? No, no, it's, it's no longer. Oh, um, it's office blocks or, or apartments or something now. It's um, long gone. But um, I was there for, for, for the opening of the, the Fitzroy oh, really? Telly Theatre, which was Norm wow. Spencer's um, baby. And um, then... Yes, the region like, Fitzroy, that's it. Yeah, then yep. things like uh, Sunnyside Up, I worked on that. Homicide, when it was out there, before it went back to Channel 7. Uh, Video Village, Consider Your Verdict. Wow. Yeah. All through that era. Mm. So let's let's get more up to date. And you played Sandy Pierce in The Young Doctors from 1977 to 1978. How did you get the part? And, and can you tell the fans a bit about that character? Um, okay, so now we are going back a while here. Um, Yes, that character, Sandy was the girlfriend and later on the wife of, um, of um, Helen Gordon, the secretary's son, who was the manager of a rock and roll band. Uh, and I believe, as I recall, that Mark Hembro was the singer of the rock and roll band. As I recall that the... I don't really, I, to be honest, I don't remember very specifics about the character, except that she wasn't very approved of, I believe, by um by by his mother. Do you remember the Rick Herbert's um character's name in that? I don't remember. Roger, is it Roger Gordon? Roger. Yes. Roger Gordon, that's right, Roger. So so Helen was his mum, Roger was the son. And um Helen didn't like Sandy very much and didn't really think she was the right girlfriend from him, for him. And then he had an accident. He slips on a, by the pool. Roger has an accident slipping by the pool, became a paraplegic and Sandy married him. And so redeemed herself as being, oh, she really is a loyal, you know, she's the right girl for, for, yeah. for this fellow. I believe that's the how the storyline went. And of course I knew Rick Herbert before that. He was represented by my mother and uh, was a very talented uh, musical theater guy. I'd seen him in Ned Kelly and been very impressed impressed by him and uh and then yes met him that got to work with him on the young doctors uh which was lovely and my brother my brother was actually doing he was very young oh no it wasn't when I was in there because I was only 16 my brother was younger than that but uh it was a year later that my brother was working standby props on the young doctors and then before he moved into the camera department wow amazing yeah. Now, my next question was about Rick, but we'll talk about, we've just spoken about Rick and we will talk about yeah. him in the, the prisoner thing. But, um, <laughs> now, I just want to ask, are you an actor that likes to audition or doesn't like auditions? Uh, I don't know that any actors like auditions. Do they? Have some, have some actors said they like auditions? I've heard some say. <laughs> I guess I don't. <laughs> um I mean, it's it's always nerve wracking auditioning. I mean, I I think I've I've sort of had the advantage. I, I felt like I had an advantage over many of my contemporaries as I, especially when I was in my late teens, early twenties, late twenties, uh, because I started so young. Um, because I started acting so young. By the time I was sixteen, I had done a lot of work. Yeah. But I but I had also been for a lot of auditions that I hadn't gotten. So I was accustomed to rejection, which is something that actors really need to become accustomed to. Like you, you have to get very good at being told, no, no, we don't want you. We want somebody else. And, yeah. and sometimes, um, sometimes that's very difficult and, uh, and other times it's easier. For me, I think I, I, I learned very young uh, that, that it was just part of, that you just had to you had to get good at, at at being told no and not to take it personally to just even if you thought that the that the person who got the job that, that you would have been better than them um even if you believe that there's no sort of room for resentment because uh, like I always say about acting and people what, what people think about actors and different performances is that um 
you're only ever as good as somebody thinks you are. You know, like somebody either enjoys your performance or they don't. Uh, you know, I, I think Robert De Niro is a really great actor, but I know people who really don't like him. Does that mean he's a bad actor or a good actor or neither? It's so much a matter of, of, of opinion, you know, and, and, as, and as an actor, you always have to, you have to build up some sort of resilience about, against people's opinions, you know? Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, so so auditions. No, I I I don't like auditioning. Um, uh, but I've been for some. I've had some some fun auditions. Actually, I'll, do you want one anecdote about a really funny audition? Yeah. Um, I, I have to tell a little story first. Oh no no no! I'll tell you about the audition first. So I went for this audition, and uh, it was with uh, the director was P J Hogan, quite a well known director. And it was a role I didn't get, uh, but the audition was fun. Uh, so I went, PJ H Hogan was the director and I was the actor reading with me. They had an actor reading with me and it was a wonderful actor called Colin Moody. And anyway, in this, <laughs> this, this, this was a bit of a dodgy, a bit of a funny audition, I suppose. But anyway, I, I kind of, I honestly don't even remember what it was for. But it was in a it was in a Bondi apartment. It was in his apartment. So there's Colin Moody, there's PJ Hogan, and we're doing these lines and doing whatever. And then he said, "Oh, let's do a bit of an impro." And the impro was he wanted us to be playing Twister, naked and covered in oil. We weren't naked, like we did it in our clothes. But but he said, "Just imagine that you're naked and covered in oil, and you're playing and you're and you're playing Twister." And I was like, "Yeah, okay, you know." Uh, so. So we did that and whatever, the audition was over and, and that was just an audition. Some years later though, and this is really, honestly, this is such, I find this hilarious. But anyway, some years later, I went to see a play with my friend Denise Kirby, another lovely actress, and Colin Moody was in this play and he was just fantastic. We just thought, oh my God, wasn't he wonderful? We were, we were absolutely besotted. And so afterwards we're having a drink in the bar and we're waiting for the actors to come out and then out comes Colin and and I and, and Denise says, oh, we should go and tell him, we should go and tell him, you know, let's go and say hi and tell him that we thought he was fabulous. And um, and anyway, I was really nervous and very starstruck and um, I had absolutely no memory of doing this audition with him. And uh, anyway, we we go up to him and, and he's a very, very big, tall man and and he's he's standing at the bar and he's got his drink and he's looking looking down at us like this as we're going oh Colin you know we just want to tell you you're just so fantastic we just think you're marvelous and and he's nodding away and then he looks at me and he says you know we've met before don't you and I said I said really have we because I'd just totally forgotten I'm terrible like that and and he, he said yeah he said I can't believe you don't remember and I said really and and he said you don't remember we played Twister <laughs> naked covered in oil and my friend who was just absolutely besotted with him she was like How could you, that? you know and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and like my eyes are getting bigger and bigger and I was like man I said honestly I, I swear I would remember that <laughs> I, said, I, swear, I, will, I would remember that and then as I said it I thought oh yeah you do I remember, remember that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was really funny he did it so well it was really funny yeah so anyway that's hilarious. <laughs> Do you think the rejections in an audition make you stronger for the next audition? It really pushes you to, to go harder at the next one that you get? I, it, it can go either way, I think. Like, I, I think it depends on so many elements. It can be, it can, I think, totally crush your, your confidence for a while and, and you just feel, you know, really terrible and, and and you can't do it or you or you might feel more determined especially if you feel like you do, if you feel, if you feel like you've done a good audition for me anyway if I feel I've auditioned as well as I could have and I didn't get the role I'm okay with it I think well you know I did the best I could it wasn't what they wanted I, I never even think in terms of I wasn't good enough I just think it wasn't what they wanted they wanted somebody older younger different whatever you know there's so many things that 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 uh, are, are involved in the casting pro process and I think you have to be very careful if you want to stay sane as, as an actor to not take these things too personally you know yeah. um, 
So yeah, I think it can go either way, depending on what, how fragile your mental state is at, at the time. Mm. Yeah. You won, played Sally Kennedy in The Restless Years in 1980. Uh, tell us about that. Well, that, that is one that I don't have very strong memories of working on that one, to be quite honest. I was very distracted by a lot of other things at that particular point in my life. Um, I remember, I think I, I got murdered by a psychiatrist or something, didn't I? Did I? <laughs> Is that the one? I think I, I think I, I think I ended up a murder victim in that one. Um, the restless years and was um, it was a Channel Ten production, was it? Or yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Channel Ten. Yeah, I think it was Channel Ten in Sydney. I know it was shot in Sydney. Um, but, but to be perfectly honest, I don't remember a lot about working in that. I think Ned Ned um, Lander was in it. I remember being doing a lot of work with him, and he was he was a lovely boy from down Wollongong Way. Um, but I, I, to be perfectly honest, I don't have strong memories of working on that particular show. No, that's so, yeah. Now, you did play in Sons and Daughters. You played the role of a troublemaker, Tracy King yeah. in 1985. With Lisa, it, of course, yeah. Crittenden, yeah. What was that like being on Sons and Daughters, working with some amazing cast? Yeah, on there? yeah that was fun. Like, Sons and Daughters was fun. And I also, I, you know, I played this tough-looking, leathery, wearing leather girl. And, and, and I had a very close friend of mine who uh, uh, played my offside, a guy called Robin Cock who was also in Sweet and Sour, um, a, a lovely ABC series. And he died very young. Uh, he, he had a brain aneurysm. It was very, very sad. He was only in his 30s. And he was a dear, 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 dear friend of mine. I did a wonderful stage production with him and he was a good, good friend. So it was really great having a, a real, like a real proper friend to work with in that. And, and Lisa was great on that, of course. And I was really mean to Lisa on that. I remember I was very very cruel to Lisa on that. Cause I think we started in Prisoner around the same time as well, Lisa and I, it was, uh, we, we, we came into the show very similar time. And uh, she was, she's a good girl, Lisa. I like Lisa a lot and lo lovely actress. Yeah, yeah, Sons and Daughters was fun. Sons and Daughters was, and it was fun to play a mean girl because I, you know, I'm usually more typecast as a lovely, nice, gorgeous person, you know? <laughs> so it's always good when you get to do something, uh, something oh, that stretches me a little bit. Mm, it was fun. You also played um, the main character, Rebecca Sharp, in the Firefly oh, yeah. movie and then yeah. the TV series that followed in 2004. Can you yeah. tell us about that show and about your character? Yeah, well, that that was... I, I loved working on that. No, I, I was really disappointed that we didn't get a, to do a second season of that because they were very young, uh, very young script writers. And I felt like... Uh, uh, I, I, I felt like if they'd been given a chance, like they made they made some mistakes in the writing and the storyline plotting, I think, like they didn't do as, as well as they could have. And I was sorry that, that, that they didn't get a, a second season to uh, improve on that and to, to learn from their mistakes because there were, there were some very young writers on that. Um, but, you know, it's funny, you know, All Saints took about two years before it really got a, a, a big, strong following. Yeah. But nowadays, nowadays it has to be... It has to be so quick. You have to get an audience so quickly before it's, yeah. before things are, are taken off the air. One of the most exciting things for me um, working on uh, playing that character in that role was having the wonderful, wonderful actor Russell Kiefel played my, play my husband. And he also died quite suddenly and, and oh, wow. too young, only a few years ago. And it, it, his wife, is also a good friend of mine. Um, we did Mum's the Word, a stage play together for many years, for over a year, I think. It was a long, long stage run. And um, he, he, he was such a wonderful actor. I was just delighted to get to work with him and, and to work with him so closely. Um, and also to work with um, Drew Forsyth is a wonderful actor and his son, Abe Forsyth, played my son. And he, he was lovely to work with as well. Of course, John Howard, uh, not John Howard, John, um, you know who I mean. How could I, how, how could I forget his name? You know, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, hang on. What, John Waters. Oh, John Waters. <laughs> John Waters. 
I forget his name. That's terrible. I adore John Waters. Uh, and he is delightful. John Waters is a truly delightful man. And uh, actually, it was funny, you know, when I auditioned for that, um, I played Rebecca Sharp, as you, as you said, and the, char the character of my husband, his name was Sharpie. And, uh, uh, and when I auditioned for it, uh, which was a great audition, uh, that was a great audition process. And I was really delighted to get to get that role. Um, and I did have to really audition for that. So that, that felt like a nice, a nice role to get. But when I, when I read the, the script and I saw that the, my husband's character's name was Sharpie and they'd only cast two people at that stage and I didn't know who they were playing. And it was Libby Tanner and John Waters. And when I saw that my husband's name was going to be Sharpie, I thought, oh, it's going to be John Waters because he's got that scar, you know, he's got this great scar on his face. And I thought, oh, for sure he'll be playing Sharpie. Like, that'll be so cool to have, you know, gorgeous John Waters playing my husband. And then it ended up being Russell Kiefel, who is just awesome, but not like John Waters at all. Like, he's a really, he was a really quirky looking guy and a great comedy guy. And it was kind of like from the sublime to the ridiculous in a way, but I, but I loved it. I, I just loved working with Russell. That was a great show to work on. Great, great crew, great cast. We, we had, we had fun working on that. Wow. Can, can I ask you just by 2004, you're a pretty well known and established actor and been on many TV shows. And you just mentioned, you know, the writing of that show probably could have been a bit different are you someone that could give advice like would you go up to them and say you know I suggest this or you just sort of get the script and no I've never had confidence of that like it's funny because I I I am I am a good writer like I, I I I love English I love the English language I love talking obviously um and I have a nice turn of phrase when I write like I think I'm a a, a really yeah. good writer but I, I feel like I'm more of an essayist than a drama writer. I, I've never, never written um, a play or had the desire to write drama. I don't. I do not feel confident <clears throat> about a big reader, you know, big movie watcher. But no, it's funny. My, my like my husband's a songwriter, and he, his style of songwriting is often very storytelling. He has a very storytelling sort of mode. And he, he tells stories not about his own life, but he imagines characters and I would say he has more of that sort of creative sort of expression than, than I do I, I no, I would never go up to a writer and say oh you really should do this and you should do that no I I, I think there are people who are much better well, than that. yeah no I mean because you've been on so many shows by that you know by that stage you probably have I know you'd think you'd think I would have learned something by now wouldn't you bloody hell no. <laughs> now also you've had a lot of guest roles and you've had a lot of regular roles on tv shows do you, do you prefer the guest roles over a regular role or do you prefer a regular role over a guest role well it's a different experience of course like um it's a different a very different experience being a guest as to being a regular cast member it's i mean it's lovely being a regular cast member there is a nice for one thing of course actors um are so freelance in their income yes. that uh that if you if you're a regular there's a sort there's a certain um uh level of comfort that you have you know yeah. whereas that whereas when you're doing a guest role you're hoping that you'll 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 be interesting enough to uh get another part that somebody will see it and, and give you some more interesting role uh, having said that uh, some of the guest roles i've done have been really interesting guest roles and uh and some of the the regular characters i've, I've played have been a bit more ordinary you know so uh so uh yeah it, it's just, it's just different but i think being a being a regular cast member is always is always lovely uh in that you can get a, a real there's a real family sense on a film set with, with 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 both the crew and the and the the cast you know and, yeah. and when you you are really part of that like every day week by week it, it, it's a lovely thing. Also, though, uh, the regular actors in shows, especially long-running shows like like Prisoner or Home Home and Away, um, or, or the shows, even more so shows like Country Practice or GP, where they're very self-contained little stories rather than soap operas, where there are these continuing storylines. The regular cast love the guest actors. They love they love oh, okay. they love having a guest actor. And so, as a guest actor. Uh, you're, you often feel very appreciated and respected, and, and um, 
it's it's nice to have people say, oh, it's so lovely to have you on set and it's so lovely to work with you. And, you know, the re regular cast members really enjoy guest actors. So there's, you know, good things about both different. different I always movies. imagine a guest actor being like the new kid at school. You know, the, the, the first day at school, it's sort of all, it's all new, nervous. Yeah, well, it, well, it, it is. Well, I suppose it is like that, if, especially if it's a guest actor who hasn't, you know, is somebody new. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for somebody, for somebody like me who, like, by, by 25 years old, I'd been a guest Done a actor lot. on lots of things and, and lots of people knew me already. So it was more like, oh, hey, I know you and I know half the crew. I, I mean, I'd all, I always, of course, knew more crew than any other actor because my sister and my brother, both being film crew, um, <laughs> I mean, for me... No. Like at, the height, at the height of my career, I'd go into a, a film set, and even if I didn't know anybody on this film set, half of them would know my mother or my <laughs> sister or my brother. You know, so everyone's like, "Oh, I love Frank, love Janet, love Joy." You know, like so. I, I, I sort of always, always felt very welcome yeah. on every, every film set, and I always knew more film crew than anybody else <laughs> on the set. Yeah. yeah, you're also a, a voiceover artist, and and a very familiar voice at Australian checkouts. Yes, How did that's you get into doing that and what aspects of it do you enjoy? Well, okay, that's a good question. I, I that is something that I also started very, very young because as a as a young actress, when they wanted a a, a kid's voiceover, they'd go for a young act, you know, somebody who had some drama experience. So I actually did my first um my first voiceover at about 11 or 12. Uh, and some of the people I worked with on that day, um, I'm still working with today. Um, so I, 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 I did the occasional voiceover when I was starting at about 11, every six months or you know maybe two or three times a year, there'd be some job for a kid. And then by the time I was in my teens, I was getting a little bit more work, you know, and then all the way through my twenties when I was a very busy actress, I was also doing voiceover work and I'd, I'd sort of average maybe two or three voiceovers a, a week. For, for many years, I averaged two or three voiceovers a week. Wow. And then, and yeah, and, and then, um, so I so I'd had a, like, I wasn't like a busy voiceover artist, but I was, um, but I'd had many, many years of regularly doing voiceovers. So I was an experienced voiceover artist. And then I, I remember, in my early 30s, about shortly after my daughter was born, I think, um, I, I did I did a voiceover at one tiny little studio, but they had never seen me before. They'd never used me before. And I did a voiceover and this engineer was like, wow, who are you? Like, you're fantastic, you're great. And I said, oh yeah, well, you know, I'm Anna, I do voiceovers. And and anyway, he um, he just decided that I was fabulous and that he discovered me. And over the next really three or four weeks only, he used me for about three or four different jobs in his tiny little studio, but they were all for different clients and from big agencies, you know, J. Walter Thompson's and Leo Burnett's and all these different producers. And within six weeks of doing that first job with him, I went from doing two or three voiceovers a week to all of a sudden I was getting, you know, eight, 10, 12 and, <laughs> and just like that like it was really all, all of a sudden and I remember waking up one morning and looking at my diary and thinking wow all these voiceovers and I remember thinking gee I used to be an actress who did the occasional voiceover <laughs> but I think, I think maybe now I'm a voiceover artist who does a little bit of acting so it was kind of very organic for me I just kind of became a voiceover artist accidentally yeah so wow. and, and and the other question you asked about the difference and what I like about it uh you know, one thing about, you, you know, I was talking about actors and people's opinions of performances. You're only ever as good as an actor. As an actor, you're only ever as good as somebody thinks you are when they're watching you. And they can think, oh, I love her. Or they can think, eh. Yeah. Or, and it's just, and they're perfectly entitled to that opinion. Neither are right or wrong. But as a voiceover artist, there is there are actual skills involved. And I'm really good at them. You know, I... I, I and, and so when I do a job, uh, when I do a voiceover, I know I'm good at it. I know I know how to do it. Um, and I know I always leave my clients really satisfied and, uh, and, and I can be sure of that. 
and and that's that's a nice thing to have as an actor to think you know like because as, as an actor I'm as good as somebody thinks I am but as a voiceover artist I know I'm good I'm really really good that's why I get a lot of work you know and uh and and, and there are skills skills involved that I that I just learned picked up over the years and have and have honed over the years and 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 there's a certain level of um, respect that I get as as a voiceover artist that that I that in Australia you really don't get <laughs> much respect here. We are a cultural wasteland here in Australia, generally speaking. I don't know if it's in the budget, but the cuts to the arts in the recent budget is just, yeah. a, a, just appalling. Like yeah. we have no respect. We have no respect for the arts in this country at all. And uh, that is one of my little soapbox rants that I can get onto. But I I I just think it's I think we treat the arts disgustingly in this country. Um, it's amazing so they do that because the government always calls on the arts in when there's a the problem, you know, bushfires, they want to yeah. raise money, floods, all sorts of yeah. things. They always call on arts. And there was no support for there was no support uh, for the arts during the COVID, you know, pandemic at all. And it's, I mean, it's terrible. <laughs> so yeah, so there there are things. In in fact, the my agent now. Uh, uh, is RMK, uh, which is which is a voiceover agency, and when I needed to change agents last time, and this was many years ago now, I've been with RMK for many years, and I didn't I didn't want to go straight to a voiceover agency. I, I wanted, to, you know, the, many years ago, I wanted to have an agent who could look after me for my acting work, but who also understood my value as a, as a voiceover artist because. I've certainly made a lot more money in my career through voiceover than I ever have through my acting. Oh, wow. And so it's literally, you know, a, a, a valuable thing. And so I wanted to find an, a, 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 an agent who could represent me for both. And I, I, I won't men mention any agency names because uh, I won't do that. But, but there was one particular agent that I thought, well, these people would be really good. They're a really great actors agency. But they they also have some really good voiceover artists, so so they will understand that it's, I mean, and it it may sound arrogant, but but they will understand that it is to their advantage yeah. to have me on their books because they don't even have to do anything at all, and if they just sign me up, I can make them in commission a lot of money, most than more than most actors just with my commission, and they don't even have to raise a finger. So of course they'll value me. So I wrote to them and said, oh, look, I'm looking for a new agent. You know, you probably know me. Here's my CV. I'm, I'm also, you know, a really busy voiceover artist, blah, 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 blah. And I got the most standard rote email rejection back. Oh, wow. And, and I just thought, wow. You, I, like, I, honestly, I was so, I was insulted. I thought, and I, and I was also, it really dropped my opinion of that particular agent. Uh, and I thought, you know what, I want an agent who's going to actually value me for, for who I am. And so RMK were the best agency in, in town, in Australia, the biggest voiceover agency in Australia. And so I, I emailed them and I said, would you be interested in representing me? And they were, they were just so delighted, so delighted to have me and were, we couldn't believe that I wanted to be with them, you know, and have, and have treated me so well ever since. Oh, I'm so good. So, so that's the kind of different that that I, that's probably a pretty thorough answer to that question about acting voiceover. You know, I, I I get different things from both of those those careers. I love acting; it's really fun. It's a wonderful creative process, and I, I adore it. But I but I'm lack ambition. I lack ambition like no other actor in this country. I care so little these days. I I, I really do. I, I I you know, like you're talking about auditioning before. I, 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 I rarely will audition for anything these days. I just think if somebody wants to cast me, that's great. I'd love to do. I'd love to do it. But I, my, my life is very full. I, 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 I don't need it. So, and I, I have a bit more self-respect these days. I think the, um, yeah. that's just, and that's just me. Your career speaks for itself. So, I mean, yeah. you know. Well, now, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I read it. I think it's, I, I read it and I think, wow. Yeah. It's impressive, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm chuckling. I'm chuckling because of a Facebook exchange I had with some stranger recently. I'm a bit mouthy on Facebook, so 
and I got into some little thing with a with a Facebook person and and they obviously went and um looked at my page or something and came back and said oh so you're a failed actor oh what a, fa a failed actor and I thought I, I actually burst out laughing when I read it I, I thought wow that's hilarious because I look at my CV and I think wow was I actually good enough to get all that work? I'm impressed. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. Good old uh, keyboard warriors. They're great. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, I'm going to throw a fan question at you just while we are talking about voiceovers. Joseph said, apart from being a great actor, I heard that she was also the famous Telstra lady, the voice of Telstra services like Message Bank 101, and disconnected services for many years. Would love to see her repeat some of those Telstra announcements in person. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I've just had an email come through for something I've got to record in a little while. So you can have a preview of a new, uh, let's see what it's for here. Hang on. Okay, here we go. This is what, this is what I'll be, be recording when I finish this interview. Welcome to the Telstra Integrated Service Desk for DFAT. Did you know that if you are registered to Telstra Connect, you can report and track faults online? To take advantage of this feature, please sign on to connectapp.telstra.com or alternatively, please hold the line and we will answer your call as soon as possible. Please remember that calls may be recorded for coaching and quality purposes. Wow. And I'm sure during the pandemic, everyone has heard you because everyone is on hold on the phone for, for, for absolutely all sorts Look, of services. I do, I do all. Of course, I do self-service checkout in Australia as well, and, and the and the all this Telstra stuff and other other phone work. So when people, if I meet a stranger at a party and they say, "Oh, so what do you do? Like, what job do you do?" I usually say, "Well, I do a job where I can pretty much guarantee you that someone." somewhere is swearing at me 24 hours a day someone someone is swearing at me either down a phone line or at a self-service checkout i'm you know i was voted once the most unpopular woman in sydney by on, on the uh, abc radio on richard glover's show he said who, who is it in, in australia in sydney that we that we really hate the most and it was the telstra lady and i oh, ran and, <laughs> and then and guess what my mother on, on the same, on when Virginia Trioli from Melbourne was up here for a while on ABC radio, and she was she was a Melbourne person and she was trying to find out um, what Sydney was all about. And so she ran a little competition saying, who is the, who do you consider the most um, admired Sydney cider? Who's not really famous? Who are the people who are, who we don't really know about who, who, who's the most admired Sydney cider? So I was voted the most hated person in Sydney and my mother, was voted the most admired what? Sydney <laughs> So family of extremes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for doing that. That was, uh, I mean, we've all heard that, that, that message uh, in our lives. That's great. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> now you also, to add to your work, you're also a sign language interpreter. Now, how did mm. that come about? That's a very interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, that came about when I did a workshop, an actors, it was a professional actors workshop. A woman came over here from America and all these actors, or a lot of my colleagues, we did this workshop for actors and we had to bring a monologue and we were working on this same monologue, our own monologue, uh, each, you know, over and over again, over the weekend. And one of the actors was an American deaf actress, uh, Caroline Aquilee, that was, that was her, sign name and she was uh, she was this short dumpy little woman very very plain little woman and she had a sign language interpreter with her and so of course she did her her monologue in sign language and the interpreter was voicing it for her so it was the first time I'd really got to see sign language and especially repeated over and over and over again with the English so that I could pick up a few signs and she was so gorgeous like she was she just turned into this other thing when she was doing this monologue in sign. And it was such a, such a beautiful, expressive language. Uh, and I just fell in love with the language uh, uh, on that weekend. I was just pregnant at the time. And so I remember thinking to myself, 
I'm going to learn that one day. That is so beautiful. And then I just forgot about it. And when my daughter was born, uh, you know, I, I wasn't doing a lot. I didn't have a lot of work for a while, like the first year or so she was born. I wasn't doing a lot of work. I, 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 I still, I wasn't a busy voiceover artist yet. <laughs> and, um, and I just thought, oh, what'll I do? What'll I do? And I thought, oh, you know what? Why don't I learn sign language? That, that'd be fun. So I went to TAFE and started studying sign language just for fun. And then I just got quite involved with the deaf community and they all encouraged me. There was a real lack of interpreters, sign language interpreters in the country at that time. And so they really encouraged me to continue my studying and um, become an accredited sign language interpreter. I'm only accredited at the paraprofessional level, uh, which is a profession, uh, uh, they call it, it used to be level two and level three, level one, level two, level three. So I'm a level two interpreter. Or, or a paraprofessional interpreter. It's sort of like level one, level two, level three. So I'm not, I'm not a quite a, a level three interpreter, but, I, but I've been interpreting for many years, working for the Deaf Society and um, the National Auslan Booking Centre, which is uh, the medical medical booking service. And um, yeah, it's it's mm. it's great. Yeah, it's an interesting. I mean, I mean, it's a beautiful language. You know, I love it. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, very, that, that was a, and also that's another thing as opposed to acting where I had to really study, I had to pass exams and then I got accredited. It was like, I can do this. I actually, I can say, yes, I can do this. I have qualified, you know, it's also nebulous. Well, when you're actor. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything you can't do? I mean, you make cheese, scones, you grow vegetables, <laughs> you've acted in you. TV I shows. Cannot, I cannot clean the house. I cannot clean the house. We can excuse <laughs> <laughs> let's um let's talk about stage roles can you tell us in your out, out of your stage roles do you have a favorite well i really uh, probably my my favorite experience um uh, doing a play was when i did mum's the word which was really more like a storytelling play, but I worked with a lovely bunch of actresses. And the best thing about it was that it was directed by Karen Fairfax. You know who Karen Fairfax is? She was in Prisoner. She oh. was in Prisoner. She had a little role in Prisoner. And this is where I met her. Okay. I met Karen. She played Andy's sister. Oh, yes. Do you remember? And yeah. Andy's sister. So. I was in Melbourne and I, I didn't know many people in Melbourne at all. And she came in to play this little role. She only had a few scenes and we just hit it off straight away. Like she, she was, we, we just were immediately really, really good friends. And, uh, and she was, she was a really great theatre actress. And I, I, I saw her in some wonderful theatre in Melbourne while I was there and, you know, with the MTC and, and I was so jealous because because I was a tele, I was always a tele, television actress. You know, I did all this. I had this, as you've read out, this long history of television work. And um, and she was this like theater actress, like working with all these proper theater actors. And I just thought she was incredible and had this marvelous career. And I think she was a little bit jealous of me with all my television work because I I I had you know all the television work. So we we we. We, but we really loved each other and uh, and we were so delighted a few years yet later to get cast as sisters in Harp in the South and Poor Man's Orange. Oh, so, wow. and, and as I mentioned before, they, they were beautiful shows to work on and Karen was really, really close with Annie Phelan. She, she gave a eulogy at her funeral and, uh, and everything. They were very, very close. We, we were very lucky. That's my, one of my dogs. <laughs> yes, a car going down the driveway how dare it um <laughs> yes ellie ellie shush shush now um but anyway uh so we had this beautiful experience karen and i working on harp in the south and poor man's orange together and then we didn't see each other for many years and then she she was doing she became a director and was doing all this wonderful directing and she started a, a theater company a children's theater company in melbourne and did all sorts of wonderful things. She ended up marrying Paul Kelly, the singer, and has two daughters. Oh, Paul Kelly, him. really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. So her, she has her two daughters with him. But mm. I hadn't seen it for many years. And then she, out of the blue, I got this audition for Mum's The Word. And it was Karen, uh, Karen um, doing, oh, no, I didn't audition. She just uh, 
cast me in it. That's right. She didn't make me audition, which was lovely. And, and so that was a lovely reconnection. And she was wonderful to work with as a director. And so that was in about 1999, just before I started work on Home and Away, actually. I finished that production just before starting work on Home and Away. And then again, I, I hadn't seen her for many years, ran into her at Annie Phelan's funeral a couple of years ago. And only recently during the COVID uh, pandemic, she, was, she, she got stuck in New South Wales. She's from Victoria and she got stuck in New South Wales. She'd, she was on a, she'd bought a little van and was on the road. And all of a sudden, Victoria was locked down and she couldn't get home. And she just rang me up out of the blue just to have a chat. And, and she said, oh, I'll have to come and see you next time I'm in Sydney. And I said, oh, I'm not in Sydney. I'm in the Northern Rivers. And she said, really? I'm in the Northern Rivers. Oh, and wow. so she, she, she ended up coming here and staying with us uh, for ages. And it was so fantastic to, to spend time with her. And, in fact, she's coming back in a couple of weeks and... Uh, uh, and I can't wait to see her. She's oh, it's been wonderful. So yeah, that that was probably my my favourite uh, <laughs> theatre production. I, I hesitated because there was another show I did that was written a, a play written by a man called Wayne Tunks, uh, called The Girl from the West of the City, and that that was a really interesting play. And I I I I, I just I was very good in that play. I I, I did. I, it was a lovely character. I worked with a lovely actor friend of mine, Peter Flett. And uh, I think I just gave a particularly good performance in that play. It was a very small production. Not many people saw it, but, um, but it was very satisfying because I, I, knew I, I knew I did a really special performance in that. So that, that was nice. Oh, amazing. Now, out of the TV shows, movies, theatre work, voiceover work, what's your, what's your favourite thing to do? <sighs> I, do you know, it's hard. I... I don't think I have a, a, a favourite, you know. I, 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 I like doing anything I do. I like to do it Enjoy the it. best I can and, and, and do it well, you know, whether it's bake a loaf of bread or, or, or a voiceover or, or an interpreting gig or, or, or a television show. Um, and I like variety. I think I have, like, as we've mentioned several times, I started acting very young. So I've, all my life I've done you know, this for that amount of time, then had a break and then done something else and then done this and then done that. Once when I wasn't getting much acting work, I had to work three weeks straight in one office and it nearly killed me. Like <laughs> I, I, I just thought, God, how do people do this? You know, I think I have a very short attention span. So I think I'd like, I, I like doing different things. I, I like all of them. I don't think I have a favourite. I just like doing it doing things well a lot yeah wow mm. <laughs> you want you also appeared in series 12 and 13 of home and away between episodes 2729 and 2957 how did you get the part of judith Ackroyd? and had you auditioned for any other roles in the show prior to that now this is another one that i can't remember i i think I think they offered me that role, Judith Ackroyd, and I think then and then they said, "Oh, actually, can we audition her as well?" And so I, I, I think I did have to go in and do an audition as well. But um, yeah, that was uh, that was, I mean, home and away. Honestly, that show to work on, they look after you so well. That 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 is a, a lovely. Or, or when I certainly when I was in it, um, I just felt like wow, they they this production perhaps because it's been going for so long and probably the core cast have a lot to do with it um i'd say the core cast over the years um you know made sure that 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 all the actors especially the young actors were treated very well because it is a little bit it can be a little bit harsh the um soap opera for for the young actors they do tend to you know chew them up and spit them out a bit um yeah. and i did i did feel a little bit like it was hard for some, some, some of those young people who, because while I, yeah. I said they look after you very well, they look after you so well and you are treated so very, very much like a star and really, really looked after in every single way that when it's all over, it's a little bit of a shock, I think, for, for some of those young actors. Um, so there's, there's, I guess there's good things and, and bad things about that. Uh, I mean, it's hard, you know, it's hard for actors, I think, because... Uh, 
you know, creative people generally uh, can be a bit fragile. You know, it's just the nature of creativity. And yet the business is so harsh. And, yeah. and so it, it's, um, you know, I think, I think I am one of the lucky ones in being a fairly resilient kind of personality and, uh, and not feeling too dependent. If I had to feel dependent on just the acting I've done in my life and my acting career to feel good about myself, I think that would be very hard. I've had a lot of other things that, that have helped me feel okay about myself and and also the advantage of uh, of starting very young um, and, as I mentioned before, getting used to rejection and understanding that that's not something that I should let hurt me. Yeah. Um, you know, to have some sort of level of toughness about that. But uh, I felt sorry for some of the young, the young actors on, on on home and away but uh but it but it was it was a fun show to work on i tell you they they, they really look after you and there's some gorgeous people on that ada nicodemo started on that um shortly after i i oh, was wow. in it. She, she, yeah. she's so fun lynn, lynn mcgrange is adorable uh you know like judy nunn was terrifying but i that I, you know <laughs> I was, I was fond of her as well and i because i loved her writing I, I i i i read her books you know i thought she's a great author and yeah. uh so, so fortunately, I, I I could say that to her. I could look her in, in the eye and say, "Hey, Judy, love your writing." And you know, quote a bit of the book, and that helped get me <laughs> get me in there. And she was friends with my mother as well, of course. But uh, lots of the young people were gorgeous on that. I, um, and of course, um, Stephen James King, who played my son. And I know you, you've probably got a question about him. I think. Yeah, that's okay. We can talk about it now. Yeah, he's uh, he's um, he had just had his sixteenth birthday. Uh, when when I first met him uh, in the makeup van, I walked into the makeup van and there he was getting all his crazy goth hairstyles and makeup done and uh, and we just we bonded like mother and son. Uh, we, we we really did. He is still a very very close friend of mine. Has been since the day I met him in that makeup van. He everybody loved him on set. He was he was only sixteen, but he was such an a a, a a student of drama he was so keen and he had immense respect for all the older actors he was he loved all the older older actors and so they all loved him you know like they were everybody loved Stephen. he's a very smart man and uh and a wonderful has become now because he'd, he'd be 36 now i think so i've known him for all those years since his wow. 16th birthday and and he uh he well, he directed and conceived both. I, I sent you film clips of my my husband's music videos. He directed. I and, directed them. Wow. Yeah, he directed them, conceived them. They were his ideas, his writing, his the the, the, the latest one. He filmed it all as well, and uh, he's become uh, he's like a student of comedy. He's the most wonderful comedy writer, and uh, he's been like a Tropfest finalist with his movie, his short film Little, Little Bondi, which which is kind of like like little britain but 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 he's done an australian version just just as this little small, short film but he, he's he's wonderful he, he's seriously talented fellow got a full scholarship to juilliard in in uh, new york and went and studied at, oh, wow. at juilliard yeah yeah so he's he's uh he's a very talented boy and, and a much loved uh member of my family is how i think of him so, amazing yeah. had you um had you watched home and away prior to going on to be honest, I hadn't watched a lot of it. I, I I had seen, you know, I was I was aware of it, and 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 I did watch a little bit before I started filming. Um, but uh, but I, I, I in the past, I don't think so much nowadays. It's changed a little over the yeah. years in time. But but when but when I was doing it, then I I must admit I did think of it as like children's television. <laughs> But uh, but it but it's changed over the years, of course, and has, yeah. Um, yeah, a little more dramatic. Even even when I was on it, I think it, it did that. Kimberly Cooper was fun too. She was a she was a really good girl. I liked her a lot. We had fun. Yeah, Summer, Summer Bay is a pretty exciting place, isn't it? A lot, a lot of things. Uh... <laughs> Grouse, locust place, and you uh, name it, they uh, got uh, it. Yeah, it's yeah. fantastic. Actually, I tell you one little inside bit uh, that I that I always loved. You know, um. Uh, 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 we, we all we all watched the absolute determination of the sportsman in Leighton Hewitt 
really courting young Beck. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. He was, it, it was like the talk of the thing. Like it, you'd be in the green room and the phone would ring. Say, oh, 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 is Beck there? Like, it's late again. <laughs> Oh, really? he, he, he really he really wanted her yeah so that, that was that was funny it was great to great to watch that all happen that was hilarious yeah, wow. she's, she was great too she was a lovely girl she's a good girl yeah wow yeah. did you want did you actually get a character breakdown for, for the part for judith uh yes i think i i think i did um sorry that's right um uh yeah she uh judith i can't remember the character breakdown she was kind of pretty ordinary <laughs> she it was more her son her relationship with her son more than anything i think and uh i, I always remember when um uh, of course my husband the character of my husband was uh, was dead by then but uh, there was a, a scene where there's a video of where he's talking to his son who has Huntington's d disease because he had Huntington's disease as well. And that character of my dead husband was played by Peter Sumner, who's, who's a beautiful, you know, really beautiful actor. And I remember I told you before that uh, Russell Kiefel played my husband in, um, in, in Fireflies. And, you know, they both, they died within a week of each other, Russell Kiefel and Peter Sumner. And oh. I remember, I remember thinking at the time, "Wow, two of my screen husbands have have died." I guess I must be getting old. <laughs> but but, uh, but I, I remember thinking, I remember being quite uh, quite moved by that. Two two very very fine Australian actors. Mm. Wow. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I think she was just a little, you know, she was pretty smart canny kind of woman single woman got to have a fling with uh gorgeous gorgeous dave uh what's his name what was his name again who i had the fling with oh um what's his name dave 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 woodley is the actor david woodley yeah yeah, yeah. he was gorgeous he was a lo lovely guy and then and then of course the fantasy romance with uh old mr fisher well, that's the, actually that's what my next question was. Uh, yeah. yeah, Norman, sorry, Norman uh, Coburn, Coburn yeah. one of my favorite characters, Flathead. Now, what was it like working so closely with him? Which is also a fan oh, question right. from Adam as well. Yeah, yeah, no, he was great. We got on very well, Norman and I. And in fact, I was only thinking about him recently because he used to talk um, about how he'd love to go down to Tasmania and live in Tasmania and have a vineyard. And I was just I, I was Googling him the other day for, for some reason, maybe thinking about this, <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> and, um, and I realized he is living in Tasmania oh, he is. And, I, wow. and I very much hope he has a vineyard. Yeah. So I thought, Oh, I really hope that's where he is. And that's uh, what he's doing. Cause I haven't obviously haven't seen him since he's, he's moved down there if he has, but um, yeah, no, he, he, he was, he was a lovely man, very smart man. And, I mean, I know he had a bit of a grumpy reputation, but um, I, I always got on very well with him. I'm just going to get myself a glass of water. Oh, yeah, that's okay. No problem. I will just... Uh... Now, let's talk about Prisoner. You appeared in 35 episodes of Series 4 and 5 in the 1982-1983 between episodes 304 and 339. How did you get the part of Paddy Lawson and had you auditioned for any other roles before that? Do you remember the audition, if you did? Well, I, I definitely hadn't auditioned for any other roles before that. Um, and I was just talking to my husband about it this morning because I, I, I said to him, I don't remember auditioning for Prisoner. I don't know if I auditioned for it or not. And he said to me, wasn't somebody else cast in the role and then they couldn't do it for some reason? And so, oh. so they offered the role to you. And I said, I think you might be right. Because I remember when I was given the character breakdown, my eyes were almost popping out of my head because back then I was extremely thin. I was a very, a very thin little person. And 
she was described as this huge, scary. I mean, I think one of the characters talking about me in the in the in my first opening episode says, "She's got more muscles than the freak." <laughs> and I remember reading it and thinking. I don't know how to act that like I'm this skinny little thing these clothes are hanging off me so I think he I think my husband's probably got that right that that, that the the role was not I, I shouldn't have been cast in that role or, or I wasn't cast in that oh, role no, initially no. uh so it so I remember I remember with the early episodes feeling very self-conscious about the fact that 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 I really wasn't like how could I be? How could I be as as scary as Maggie Kirkpatrick? I mean, yeah. how could I? You know, like that that was really that was very very challenging. It was I was a little bit uh, I was very nervous. I remember being very nervous my first my first couple of weeks there. I remember that very well. Yeah. Just being nervous. What was the first day like? Like first day on set, walking into Wentworth. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I remember. Okay, I remember my first day walking into the green room. I, my my first filming the way the way they always uh, film soap operas is they film the OB scenes, which is outside broadcast. They do you, you'll remember this, like they do the outdoor scenes one week, and the and and the next week you do the studio for the for what you've done the outdoor scenes for the year before. So I was there to do some OB work, but but it was at the studio because we were just filming in the car park. It was just a, it was in a in a van. It was in the van. It was me arriving in the van, you know, along with Margot Jane Clifton. And anyway, I had to go into the green room and wait. I had got my makeup done, got my wardrobe done, wandered into the green room. There weren't many people there um, because they were all in the studio filming. And so I just looked around the room and I I sat down in the corner. It felt like I was sitting in an out of the way corner. That's what I thought I was sitting. That's where I thought I was sitting. And so I sat there very quietly, you know, looking at my script, learning my lines, making sure I knew them. And then the scene finished and all the actors came pouring out. So this was my first meeting with the actors. And uh, I always remember this was my first contact with, with Sheila Lawrence because uh, Sheila and Judith McGrath and Elspeth all walked up to exactly where I was sitting and, and Sheila just stood there with her arms <laughs> down at me. And I, I was looking up and thinking, oh, what have I done? And she says, you're in my chair. And I was like, oh, oh sorry, sorry, you know. And I, th I think she may have thought at that point that I was an extra and that, and that I should have known better because all the extras were quite regular. They were like, the, the, the extras were great on, on, on that show. And so, uh, so I, I obviously got up quick, smart, and backed away. And the three of them sat down and lit fags. I mean, you could, you know, yeah. everybody smoked everywhere those days. But, um, but uh, I, you know, I wanted to. And, and I think at some point, um, it, 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 you know, they became aware that I that I was actually, you know, not not just an extra disrespecting the. Uh, the cast. But honestly, it was like entering a bloody women's prison. I, I, I have to say, like. The, my first few weeks, because I was only 21 as well, and so there were all these, you know, much admired and respected old a a actors, because even 35, you know, even 30 was was old to me at 21, <laughs> or, or certainly way more experienced than me, you know, and the, oh man, I, I tell you, it was it was scary. Like, I, I, I found a lot of those women scary, although not the ones that you'd think, you know, like, uh, for instance, Maggie took me under her wing like she she was wonderful like I, I I love Maggie and she lives up near me now too you know she's in Brunswick Heads here so uh and she's been on my list of people I have to call um <clears throat> but uh she's she's wonderful I, I I love Maggie and the other person that I just absolutely adored was Carol Skinner oh Carol uh, yeah. I love Carol no. yeah. We do want to talk about you and, oh, Carol. and and Amanda, Amanda Muggleton and Jane Clifton. I, I loved Amanda. I've I've seen Amanda recently a few times. Actually, I saw her in a wonderful production in Melbourne uh, only last year, and it was great catching up with her. She is she's so good. She's such a fine fine actress and and so fun. She's so fun. I love her. Yeah. How far was the uh, How far was the green room from the studios, Ken? Like, was it close? Oh, really close. Just close, yeah, across the yeah. outside, 
virtually outside you walk 10 paces i actually fell asleep one time in the green room <laughs> and nobody moved me <laughs> yeah but it wasn't do you think ken it was sometimes like being in a women's prison wasn't it it was oh, yes. <laughs> very like much that. very you, much but one of, one of my main memories about the studio uh, filming in the studio in particular is uh oh gosh so much laughing on set and like like honestly like um people would get sent out of the studio like the director would get so pissed off because people couldn't stop laughing and they just get out of here come back in five minutes when you've got it out of your system like oh it was so funny but they laughed so much they 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 El elspeth and sheila i mean honestly it was funny amanda and jane and i and i were, were quite close friends for a while and and Judith and Elspeth and and Sheila, they used to you know have that little corner that they sat in, like I told you, and we used to call them the coven. <laughs> it's the coven over there. Well, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't have said that. Somebody will watch that. <laughs> but but they were lovely, and I, and of course I I actually uh, I got I I saw um, quite a lot of Judith uh, when I was doing Home and Away because she was working on All Saints, which oh, was filmed in the studio next to us. And Judith was, was great. We had, we had many a great conversation, smoking a cigarette outside the studio together. So, yeah, she, she was She had great. a very dry sense of humour. Very dry, very dry, which I actually realised it took me, I, I, honestly, she scared the crap out of me when in <laughs> the early days of, of, of uh, Prisoner. But it took me some time to realise, uh, yeah, she was just very funny. And she, I mean, Sheila was amazing, wasn't she? I mean, she was just amazing to look at as much as anything else, yeah, Sheila. She apart was. from that glorious character of Lizzie that she created. Like, that's such a beautiful, iconic uh, yeah. Australian television character. Yeah, one that you'll never forget. Um, no. Had you seen the show prior to coming on it? Were you a fan of the show? Uh, I had I had seen a bit of Prisoner, yeah. Like Prisoner was pretty watchable yeah. television back then, you know. And and also, of course, because so many um, wonderful actresses on it, um, yeah. you know, it was it was really good to see so many so many actresses being able to 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 play these these fabulous roles. And, and I had some good friends um, who who were in it that, of course, I wanted to see as well. People like Tracy Mann was a good friend yeah. at the time. And, she played a great character, and uh, I remember I remember loving watching her. Georgie, wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, yeah, she was she was great. She was terrific. I know somebody asked if I do smoke cigarettes, and yes, I do. I'm going to smoke. How do you really there. smokes? There we go. There you go. There's your answer. <laughs> Voiceover ad. Terrible, isn't it? <laughs> now we've um, we've just already covered the next question, so. Uh, Back to you again, Matt. Well, we've covered mine, so I feel like we're playing you know here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> over to Ken. What do you think? No, well, we did. We talked. We talked about Patty was a very aggressive inmate when she first came in, and my question was, did you find it difficult to portray that? And and physically, you, you said you did, but I mean, mentally, did you find it tough? Um. Well, it was a, it was a stretch for me at that point. In, in my career, you know, like I, I had, um, uh, you know, I'd, I'd played, uh, I'd played generally quite nice, sweet, gentle people, you know, that was kind of what I was cast as most of the time. Um, and yeah, like it, I, I did find it, I did find it challenging um, um, playing that role. And uh, I'd probably approach the whole thing very differently now. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I think I, I got obviously much more comfortable with the cast, and um, and I think I, I felt a certain uh, sense of relief when the storyline got to the part where she was diagnosed as claustrophobic, and and so it allowed me to sort of um, uh, pull back on the 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 the, the very aggressive uh, side of the character. Yeah, it was a change there. That yeah. they want, you know. Um, but I, I mean, I remember doing that. That I think it was. At, I think it was my first day, and certainly one of the very early scenes because it was the scene where I um 
the scene where I first arrive in the back of the van and Margot's character, Jane's character Margot was in the back of the van with me. And there's a point where she's ha makes some gag about me or something. And I had to grab her by the collar and like, be, you know, really fast. And we were talking about the laughing. I mean, I, I certainly fit into the cast in that regard because she was just making me laugh. Like, Every time I, I had it this close to my face and, and she just had this comic, like this ridiculous look on her face and I just couldn't stop laughing. And I, it was terrible. You know, when, when actors laugh and break up like that and can't stop laughing, it looks like they're having a really good time. But honestly, <laughs> there, com there comes a point where you really, you just want to stop laughing because you are pissing people off. And this <laughs> poor boom swinger, it was freezing cold, Melbourne in the middle of winter, and this poor boom swinger was lying on the floor at this metal van. It was freezing. And he's just lying there, just looking at me in my first day on set. Um, and me just, it's my first day. Like, I'm not supposed to be laughing like that, you know. Like, this is for the, this is for your Judith McGraths and your Sheila Florences. They, they can get away with it, you know. But it's my first day and I'm just holding it up by not being able to stop laughing and looking like I'm having a really good time as one does when one is laughing and just feeling like, oh, please, God, stop, stop now. You know, this poor guy, they're all going to hate you. And so that I remember that very, very vividly. But Jane and Amanda and I, we, we had we had fun on that show, yeah. They you were had another fun. funny scene with uh, Jane. I think it was in the library and uh, they locked you in the library, Margot and uh, Faye. And then uh, you came out and you were trying to bash up Margot. I think, I think from memory, it was uh, in the library. Oh, okay. I had to rewatch a bit of this. I don't remember <laughs> that. I don't remember that scene specifically, but I'll have to, I'll have, to have a look at it. It's funny because I didn't see a lot of it. Um, I didn't see a lot of my own work on Prisoner on air originally because I, I, I worked on it for around, around six months or so. And, um, and then I, I, almost immediately or, or a few only a couple of months after I finished work and there was quite a delay in those days before the, what yeah. the work you filmed made it to television um shortly after my characters started appearing on television I went overseas for, and I traveled around for a year okay and so I, I I missed I missed actually seeing it on the television in that week to week way yeah. Uh, and there's probably, to be honest, there are probably episodes that, that I've never seen. Uh, so I really should make the the effort to to watch it again, uh, because as I was telling you before that I that I reconnected with Cara and Fairfax um, only recently, and we sat down and watched Harp in the South and Poor Man's Orange together. Oh wow! Because, because we hadn't seen it for over twenty years, and uh, and it was really fantastic to watch it. Like it was. It, it's truly high quality, beautiful television. I highly recommend, uh, not for my own sake, but just for the sake of the production, that uh, people have a look at it if you've never seen it, because it, they are two beautiful pieces of, of television with lovely Charles Tingwell, Bud Tingwell in it. And, and of course, Annie Phelan. If you're an Annie, Annie Phelan fan and you've never seen Harp in the South and Poor Man's Orange, she is no Must words. Watch. Yeah. Brilliant, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful performance. So that that was good. So I really should do that with Prisoner sometime because I've you know just watched all my episodes in a row. Yeah. You know to see to see how the story pans out because I've never actually experienced that myself. Wow. Yeah. Was there um was there a hint to begin with on your first day in the van um, of the claustrophobia thing? Was that was did the writers suggest that that's yes yes like I I knew I I knew that that's what what the the issue with the character was they didn't spring that on me um a few episodes later so yeah so I, I was I was playing it I mean I think that's how I justified the fact that um that that it was uh that, that I was so aggressive because I thought you know uh it's not so much that she's an angry you know bitter angry person it's a medical condition that's making her act like this so um, I think I, I kind of tried to make that that work for my my character, so that rather than being just some nasty, tough, fighting person, 
that, that it was a medical condition that, that, that I actually played her quite nervous um, in the, yeah. as I recall, I tried to do that and trying, trying to look tough, but, um, but actually being quite, quite scared. Yeah. Well, now you mentioned before that Maggie Kirkpatrick sort of took you under her wing and you worked with some amazing cast members, you know, Judith McGrath, Sheila Florence, Val Lehman. You know, there's so many. Did you have a, I know it's probably a hard one to answer, but did you have a favourite that you really look forward to doing scenes with that was that sort of? Well, a favourite I look forward to, I don't think so because I they I, I they were all great. Yeah. You know? Like I, I I really I really did appreciate it. even at the time I, I I appreciated the fact that I was you know given the opportunity to to work with with some of these wonderful older older actors and that, and they were all all great even even the ones that I found uh, tough to work with um, in some ways like you know like Val was tough to work with sometimes um because she remained in character a lot of the time and uh and it, it, it was it was kind of tough sometimes um although of course she became very character wise a very maternal figure to patty uh, yeah. in, in a way and um uh but 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 again even with her like she was she was quite scary to work with um physically because she was quite physical um you know she didn't like to hold back with the physical stuff and um so it was like okay brace yourself you're working with val you know <laughs> like uh, yeah but uh but it was all i i wouldn't say that i had a had a had a favorite i mean it was always it was always fun if if i got to work with amanda and jane yeah uh, that, that 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 was always fun yeah <laughs> it's funny about val I, I i didn't sleep the night before we interviewed val i was really nervous <laughs> Yeah, yeah, she's she's. Ken, uh, Ken was just all relaxed as, as normal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But she's great, Val. She is great. Yes. Yeah. yeah, she's a good woman. I've got a yeah, I've got a, a fan question from Jason Burridge here. Um, mm. The typical question, I'm afraid, but how did you, how, how did Anna get on with Sheila Florence? Any funny or maybe not so funny anecdotes to share? Well, you've already shared. Yeah, um, yeah that was yeah, fun. Being in her chair, yeah. but, but there are plenty more. Yeah. Well, oh gosh, I, do you know, I, I, I was thinking about that and um, I, I, I can't. I don't have a specific story. I mean, she was just always hilarious, Sheila. Like she, she is hilarious, and because of course, I don't know if you ever got to interview her, her at all. But she's she's got quite posh in her speaking. You know, she's that coffee, you know, Sheila, that, the posh Australian accent. And there, and and as Lizzie, she was so so gorgeous. That 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 broad Australian accent was so fantastic. Um, so it it it, it was always funny seeing her talk in her normal voice <laughs> I, I always yeah it's, it's really weird to watch her talk in her, her normal voice after it, it is, it watching is. lizzie for so long it, it I, sounds I, like she's putting it on because you know yeah. her so well as lizzie so it, so, yeah. it sounds like it's actually not her real voice it's a very very amusing yeah. wow <laughs> Um, we covered my question, but I do have another question for you. As an actor, how do you how do you like to learn your lines? What's your technique for remembering your lines? Yeah, well, it's the number one job an actor has to do, isn't it? That's all you have to do, really, is is learn your lines and get them out, and then everything else is somebody's opinion on how well you say them. Um, uh, you know, I don't know. Just read the script a lot, um, learn them by myself, and then get somebody to read them with me. And uh, if I, you know, my poor family um, would have to <laughs> read read scripts with me to get to get me um, make sure I, I knew them. But uh, yeah, I suppose I started learning lines from such a, such a young age that just came yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, that's why I didn't. I never recorded them. I think some people record them and do things like that. I never did that. Just just reading them, reading it, looking at it, closing my eyes, seeing if I remembered it. What did I forget? You know, and then. Having somebody check up on me, reading against me. That's how I learn them. Must be a stressful thing, though. I mean, going on a big show like Prisoner, you're nervous about going the first day and you've got to remember lines. I mean, it must be a really big build-up of, of emotions. 
Yeah, well, certainly knowing your lines was very much in the early days when you've only got two scripts there. So you, you, you and you've only yeah. got your first day of work, you've only got three scenes or, or whatever. So you just really make sure you know those lines really well because you don't want to be holding anything up. Yeah. You know. The laughing's bad enough. You want to, want to at least know the lines. So, yeah. Paddy was subjected to one of Joan Ferguson's infamous black glove body searches. <laughs> what was it like filming that scene with Maggie Kirkpatrick? Oh, it was really fun. It was like my jet scene with Nola uh, as well, with, with, with Carol. Uh, they, they were both, uh, you know, so scary on screen. But, um, but but actually quite concerned about the actors that they were working with, uh, if there was something physically aggressive going on. Uh, I, I mean, Carol was hilarious with the drowning scene. Um, like every time they said cut, she was like, oh my God, are you all right? Like, are you all right? <laughs> she was so concerned. And uh, it was very, very, very funny. But yeah, the the Maggie scene, uh, yeah, it was, it, it was, it was fun. Like she looked after me and, and, uh, and we just, we just had fun really. I mean, they're always quite funny, those scenes, uh, those very dramatic physical scenes. There's a, uh, they're, they're, they're quite funny behind the scenes because it's like, oh, how are we going to do this, you know? <laughs> it's funny you say it. They're, they're funny. I mean, as a young person, when I was watching Prison, I mean, they're absolutely terrifying <laughs> yeah. to watch. Yeah. <laughs> I know, it's all acting. Now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, now, Rick Herbert, who played Andy, your, uh, your love interest on Prison, what was it like working with him again? Well, it was great because, as I said, I, I knew Rick from before I worked on Young Doctors yeah. uh, with him. So, so we'd already been married on screen. And I remember Ian Bradley uh, being really excited to tell me because he, he was also produced Young Doctors. And, and he was so excited to tell me that, 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 that Rick was playing this character. Uh, that he, he just thought it was really fun that, we, that he got to cast us again together. And, uh, and Rick is still a very good friend of ours, a very, very close friend, and, and is on the same agency as me as well, of course, because he's a wonderful voiceover artist himself and has been for many years. Uh, so, yeah, Rick is, Rick is um, a, a much-loved, very old friend, and, uh, and we also played husband and wife in a stage play once. So we've oh. uh, three times, three times we've been married uh, on screen and stage. Yeah. Wow. Um, you just brought up Ian Bradley's name, who we've had on, and uh, absolutely amazing, talented man. Do you have a memory about Ian that you can share? Well, that, that's probably my strongest one. Is yeah. is, is if, if when you had Bruce. the meeting, I thought, oh, what, what's this meeting about? And 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 it, it was just to tell me that, that that Rick was playing Andy, and and I always remember the look on his face because he was so pleased with himself <laughs> and so delighted to tell me. Uh, he, he was very good. Um, yeah. We he was he very much looked after us all as well. We felt very supported by by all the uh, all, all the, the producers and and the production office. They all looked after us very well. <clears throat> Excuse me. You were um, also involved in two of the best episodes of the series, The Great Fire of Wentworth, which was a fan favourite. Um, what was it like being part of that? Uh, and what are your memories of filming it? Can you tell us any behind the scene? Well, I remember it was a it was a pretty big deal, as I remember. There was a lot of um, it felt a bit different to uh, to our regular filming um, because we had you know smoke and and, and different effects that uh, <clears throat> we hadn't worked with before in small spaces and. Um, and and uh, rooftop filming on the rooftop and all, all of that sort of thing. Um, I mean, it was it was just part of the filming. Like uh, we, we had really no idea at the time that that, that they were going to be such um you know popular yeah. episodes. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so mostly I remember it feeling a little bit different. That that those that, that that period of filming was a was a little bit of a different experience to the to the regular filming. It was like, oh, we're doing the, the fire stuff today. Oh, that'll be different, you know, and and sort of different locations and and, and things. So, yeah, but uh, not that, that that's generally my memory of uh, of filming yeah. those. Yeah. 
big fan favorite those episodes and um there was a lot of questions fan questions about those episodes too so um we had one from Darren Hembro said, well, this was a fan question, but no way, no way, and thrice no way, an excellent character played by an excellent actress, talking about yourself. Patty had such a sad ending on Prisoner. I'd love to ask what it was like filming the Great Fire episodes and what storyline did you like the most whilst on the show? Oh, which storyline did I like the most on the show? Let me think. I was on there. I mean, I, I enjoyed, I really enjoyed um, the the romance story with uh, with with Rick because it, it it kind of felt really nice because it was such a sweet storyline um, in the midst of this hardcore kind of uh, yeah. you know show, and 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 we were so sweet together, you know, and and also the fact that I got to meet Car and um, around that time made it a very fond. A, a fond memory of that 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 storyline uh so that 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 probably was the my, my favorite kind of yeah. memory of this of that, that storyline yeah, yeah. i've got another um, fan question from tessie davy uh who says hi anna could you talk about the great fire of wentworth and what it was like shooting the scenes with the fire brigade um i'm, I'm asking this part of it um the question was it dangerous and did you have? I don't recall it being dangerous. I don't recall ever being uh, felt like there was any danger. Did anybody else have dangerous memories? Do you remember? No, no, no. no I, I, I don't think we ever felt in danger. Um, it felt quite exciting. I remember it just felt. Yeah, my my, my general memory of it of it is feeling like I said before that yeah. it was a bit different to our regular filming, and it was a bit exciting and sort of big you know so uh, sure was. as he actually goes on to say such a legendary storyline you must be proud to have been part of it well i certainly have been proud of it over the years i mean uh, prisoner fans are quite incredible i i mean i still i still receive to the, to this day fan mail from you know all over all over the world um on a on a semi regular basis, and I'm all, always amazed when I when I get uh, you know some fan letter finds its way to me through my agent or somewhere, and wow, people they're so devoted these fans. Um, but I, I I I can see how it it's really more in retrospect that I can see how it captured the imagination of so many people and how it's had such uh, such longevity uh, as a as a as a popular show. It, it, it was. It was quite groundbreaking television at its time in its time. So yeah, but the most loyal of fans, though, it's quite, quite remarkable. I mean, I was really quite overwhelmed when you sent me the the email, you know, with all the the sorts of questions you might be asking me and, and the fan questions, and it was like, oh, I can't believe so many people are, are so interested. And it's, it's oh, definitely, really you're a big fan favorite, your character and yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, quite overwhelming. Very, very, very lovely to know that that you've that you've brought such um pleasure to people, you know, so many people with the work that you've done. It's a really nice feeling. So I'm yeah. very glad that so many people got so much out of it and still are. It's yeah, awesome. they still do, definitely. Now, um, we did speak about Lisa Crittenden, who played Maxine Daniels on Prisoner, but also a fan question from Cole Taylor said. Hi, Anna. I loved you in Sons and Daughters as little Tuffy, Tracy Kingsford, where you once again acted alongside Lisa, but your characters hated each other. I remember a great cat fight scene between the pair of you in a bar. What was it yes. like working with Lisa and really toughening it up as Tracy? Yeah. Oh, it was great. Lisa's great. Like, she's a lovely actress and... Um, and and a, and a lovely person, a re really fun person. We we had real fun with that. I think we really we really enjoyed being able to have a, like a proper fight, a proper girl fight on screen. It was it was really really good. Yeah, we we enjoyed that very very much. Yeah. I've got uh, another fan question from Justin Dowdle. I always liked the character Patty. When Nola drowned her. How did you, Anna, manage to hold your breath underwater while pretending to drown? 
also what was it like working with Carol Skinner? Yeah, well, I've touched on that uh, a little bit. I absolutely adore Carol Skinner. Uh, again, she I got to work with her again on um, in Half in the South. She's also in Half in the South. And Poor Man's Orange plays a wonderful, wonderful character. Uh, and sh she's just one of my favourite actresses in Australia. I, I, I just love her. And she was so good to me and so gentle with me um, in between the drowning. <laughs> uh, it, 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 was, it was not hard. I don't recall it being hard at all to hold my breath um, at all. Uh, as I mentioned, Nola was terribly, Nola, Carol was terribly concerned uh, about having to do it. And it, it was... It was not not a, not a problem at all. She was she didn't she didn't hurt me at all. I held my breath just fine. It was all good. <laughs> it's a very talked about scene though between like on Facebook and all the prisoner groups and a lot of people still talk about that that yeah. sad ending of Patty. Yeah, everyone loved Patty and and she was just drowned like that. It's um it's always talked about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was a good it was a good death scene. Nice one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we covered my question, um, but what I am going to ask, did you know when you took the role of Patty that was going to be the outcome for the character, that she was eventually no, going to be No, no, not at not – I, did, I, didn't, I didn't know that, that at that point. They hadn't written that far ahead. Um, I remember when, when we did talk about that, it was funny. I, I, probably, I probably could have stayed in, that, in, that, in prison for longer uh, if I'd been um, – I think I mentioned to you that I'd only met my husband in Sydney three weeks before I had to go to prisoner. And so there was a little bit, I, there was a little bit of me when I was on prisoner really wanting to get back to Sydney. Oh, uh, okay. You know, I, I was a real Sydney person. I wasn't a Melbourne person. The Melbourne winters winter absolutely <laughs> killed me. Uh, although I did become an AFL fan for many years after, after working in Melbourne. Did he marry um, or just out of curiosity? Sydney. Sydney. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Sydney Swans. Um, although in, uh, in those days, though, there there wasn't Sydney Swans. They were they were South Melbourne. South Melbourne, yes. And, uh, so I wasn't original. I was originally a Geelong supporter. Okay. But, uh, yeah, I, I I ended up a Sydney Swans fan. But um, yeah, so I I think my 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 enthusiasm for for being in Melbourne wasn't wasn't that great. And when we got called in. Um, to talk about our, our contracts and because uh, uh, I think that initially it was a three month contract and then um, and then they wanted to extend the contract uh, and, and, and my contract did get extended um, and and then I uh, but, but before it got extended being in the office with Ian Bradley I remember thinking oh I shouldn't have I probably shouldn't have looked quite so oh really you want me to stay long <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was as i did describe myself before as the least ambitious actress in australia <laughs> so i was much more keen to get back to my fella uh, the love to, took you away from prisoner it's love could have been on longer me away. love okay. stole me away from prisoner, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. so if patty had lived would that have been the faith that you would have liked to have seen happen to her? Well, it was a great scene. Like I, 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 I've had, I've had quite a few deaths on screen throughout my career, um, and that that was a that was a, a, a really uh, that was a great one, you know. So I, I, I. I didn't. I didn't mind being written out like that at all. I thought it was a great way to get written out. I thought, oh, I'm glad I'm just not getting released you know that'd be a bit dull so it was kind of yeah. nice to go out in such a dramatic you know fabulously mm. dramatic way and with one of my favorite uh, mm. actors in the world um so yeah i would have been happy to go out like that uh yes i wonder i wonder where patty would have gone had she stayed in another year or so who would have who knows yeah. she... gone off to sydney to meet her boyfriend yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. halfway house <laughs> yeah yeah it's funny you mentioned that about that, the, the you know you're glad you got killed because it's I listen to a lot of podcasts and there's so many actors that talk about they would have liked to have been on a show longer but they got written out sooner but they were glad they got written out and killed off. Yeah, yeah. More of a yeah, they didn't just yeah, disappear. it's kind of yeah, it feels feels kind of good being yeah, being, just going out with a bang, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> now, speaking of bangs, um, the next scene I just want to talk about, which you weren't in, but it was when B killed Nola with the the home yeah. homemade oh. gun or whatever it was um, to make up for your death. Now, did you yeah. ever see that scene? Do you know, it was some years after I got back from overseas that I saw that scene and I remember thinking, oh, that's so cool. You know, <laughs> Just like, for Patty. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of nice to think that that even though I, I was gone, that, 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 that the, you know, the, the spirit of my character lived on for a while and that, and that, that, that B went to all that trouble to exact revenge on my killer. I like, it was lovely. I remember thinking, oh, wow, when she's in the hospital and she says, this one's bad, this is Patty, whatever the line is. I remember thinking, oh, for me, how nice. Right. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Now, a, a few of the actors and crew you work with are sadly no longer with us. Can you share any memories of working with people like Juliana Fox, <clears throat> Endel Flanagan, um, cast members and so forth? Well, Kendall was lovely. He was he was one of our favourite directors. He was he was really special. Yeah. Um, he dated a friend, a really good friend of mine, for a while, and he he's he, he was just lovely. Like we, everybody loved Kendall. Um, so I, he's one of the directors I remember most um, working on the show. He, he he was really really lovely. Um, of course, uh, Judith McGrath is is gone now, and um, and that was very sad because she's she was a great character, and of course Betty Bobbitt's yeah. also also gone gone now. Um, so, I mean, they, they they were all lovely to work with, and uh, and and sadly missed, you know. But uh, such is life. We're all here for our allotted time, I guess, and that's yeah. the way it goes. Yeah. Unfortunately. Um, now, when you played Patty, were you recognised a lot out in public when you went out? Was it a role that gave you a lot of attention when out, outside? Yeah. Yes, yes, I remember. Um, I remember. Well, of course, as I did say, I was overseas for a lot of the time I was on air, but for the, I think I was here for the, for the first maybe six weeks, eight weeks of, of, uh, of being on television. And, uh, and of course, my, my, my now husband, boyfriend at the time, I, I hadn't been with him that, that long. And, and he, he just found it hysterical when, when we'd go out and, and, uh, and, you know, people would, with, with that particular character, I guess, because of the nature of the show, people were not shy about, about, you know, yelling at you from across the street or, <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know why it was with that particular show, but um, you know, did other they, shows. Did they yell at your real name or your character's name? Patty, Patty, <laughs> you know, you're gonna bash someone today, or you know, like the, all of that sort of thing on buses, or, or sitting in a cafe and drinking a coffee. And my husband would always say, "Those people, those people recognise you." And I, I'd turn around and look at them, and they'd be just drinking their coffee. <laughs> and they, and they'd say, oh, they know who you are, you know. Like, <laughs> it was very, very funny. Yeah. Recognised for yeah. television work. It's always amusing. Probably more from home and away because I was on that for longer and around a lot. So yeah. and in England, you know, I, went, I was over in England when when uh, home, when I was my character was on Home and Away, and in England they they're crazy over there in England yeah. about about those Australian home soaps, the Home and Away and Neighbours, and they, they just love it. The, the English I sure family. do. Hmm. Are you still in contact with um, anyone from the show or have, have you seen anyone in, in the intervening years? Well, I've, I've, I've seen Maggie a, a, a bit and Judith, Judith as I, uh, I mentioned, when, I was, when she was in All Saints and I was in Home and Away, we'd <coughs> see each other quite a bit. Rick Herbert, of course, is a good friend. Um, I see him both, uh, you know, at work and play um, because we you know, occasionally do the odd voiceover together. Not so much nowadays as we all tend to work from home these days. So I, I mostly work from home here in my, my little home studio up here in Eureka. Um, yes, there, there are probably other people I see who, who I, I've forgotten that we've worked on that together. I mean, Amanda, of course, I, I've, I've seen um, on and off the last couple of years. 
uh, Karen, um, who, who I, I see a lot of and who's my dear, dear friend, Karen Fairfax. Um, and there's probably others as well, you know. I, I haven't seen Tracy for a while, Tracy Mann, but uh, she, she, I think she's living in South Australia these days, but uh, she's a very close friend of, of, of me and, uh, and of my husband as well. Um, so, yeah, there, there are probably more, but, um, but yeah. they're, they're, they're not quite coming to my mind right now, but yeah, quite a few of them, yeah. Are you um, you're surprised at how popular Prisoner still is to this day? Does it oh, shock you? It floors me, yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's remarkable. It, it, it is remarkable that a show made in the 80s on with, with those cheap cardboardy wobbly sets you know uh and uh that 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 it still captures the imagination of people today is is quite quite remarkable quite remarkable you know it amazes me it amazes me and and, and yeah and i and i am really I, I am really proud of having been a part of a production that has had such a you know meaningful impact on so many people's lives it's yeah it's nice to be have been a part of that yeah. following on with that have you ever watched the reimagining of prisoner um wentworth yeah and what did yeah. you think oh I, I i loved it i thought it was absolutely fantastic like i mean so different to to like really different despite the fact that that, that some of the characters uh Times. you know um, loosely based on, on on characters from the original but such a different uh interpretation and like much more much heavier and more dramatic and more um more graphic of course uh much less imagination required uh with with the with the current series than, than was in, in the original uh but oh gosh some such marvelous performances like and and again lovely to see a show that that offers those opportunities to so many actresses in the in the country uh, it's i mean so many so many great performances in, yeah. in that series I, I, I loved watching it i'll probably watch that whole series again sometime i enjoyed yeah, it so great. much yeah one of one of fox cell's highest rating dramas as well i mean it was yeah yeah well, absolutely I'm not surprised. massive high quality great you know high quality acting love lovely production values um and and great storylines some really good storylines yeah. yeah i just noticed actually some of the cast are in chicago at the moment doing a um convention for all the fans oh, over there there's four or five of them yeah it's it's huge yeah. oh, that's lovely now i know we're, we're taking up a lot of your time but we'll just we'll get on to the fan questions now the the first one's from jan who's actually our behind the scenes producer she's asked have you ever been to scotland oh yeah and oh she's god from, i uh, love scotland I love Scott. It's funny because my daughter lives in London, although she's here now just visiting us, which is a great delight. Hadn't seen her for nearly three years. So oh, well, she, surprised, she actually surprised us last Friday. She literally just, just, walked, you. just, just walked in the door. And, and honestly, my niece knew that she was coming and she'd, she'd arrived out of the blue as well, more or less. And, and she was secretly filming Polly arriving. And honestly, if I said, <laughs> If you saw the video, you'd cry too. Like oh, we were so in shock, my husband and I. And so I'm very excited about that. Uh, but but she lives in London, and my husband is English, uh, so she has the dual dual citizenship. So I've travelled. I've been to England quite a few times, and you know I quite I quite like England, but I have no idea why my my daughter wants to live there. But Scotland, love it i absolutely love scotland and so different to england in every way the population the landscape everything i got to spend two weeks there on a voiceover gig actually the very very early days um i can't remember what year it was now but it probably would have been the early 2000s uh where i got a job to do um a computer program text to voice programs where you type and and the speech comes out so okay. it was one of the very early programs of that so i had to go and do two weeks of recording all sorts of weird random sentences thousands and thousands of sentences and words to to get this program this computer program together and i had two weeks there but they only wanted me to record for three hours a day because my voice would get tired after a few hours and start to sound a bit tired so I had all this time to explore Edinburgh 
and uh, they put me up at a beautiful little apartment right near the old castle there, the Windsor, uh, not the Windsor Castle, the, the castle, it's in Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Castle, and uh, right in old town there. And um, oh, I just did every, every little tourist walk and, and just, I just wandered around Edinburgh for, for hours and hours at a time and just absolutely fell in love with it. And of course, I am a big fan of Outlander as well. <laughs> so, yeah, but I'd love to go back to Scotland. I've had some yeah. gorgeous times in Scotland. I absolutely love it. I was going to ask you about your voiceover work. You, does your, your voice does get tired after a few hours? Like, it get, does it get sore or is it just... It just starts to sound tired. Not so much when I'm talking like this, yeah. um, but when I'm doing voiceover work uh, and, and you, they, they wanted this real consistency uh, in, in, for the program. And so they just wanted me how I sounded between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. And then I was free for the day. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, your voice will get tired in, in voiceover mode. <laughs> yeah. Next uh, question is from Max Dweeb. Hi, Anna. Love Patty. Her storyline was very sad, profound, and her exit was a real shock when I first saw it. Was Patty always going to be murdered by drowning or was there a different way for her to go? Well, I think they, I, I don't know. That's probably a writer's question um, or a producer's question. Uh, I only ever, there was never any discussion about it with me. I, I just... Uh, the script. You know, yeah, I just, I just got the script and was like, whoa, okie dokie, here we go. <laughs> yeah. Um, next question from Andrew Birch. Very likable and natural actress, even though Liv... Sorry, something's cut out there. Seen her in Sons and Daughters, The Young Doctors, A Country Practice, Home and Away, thought her character Judith should have been paired off with Donald Fisher. I thought the relationship between Patty and B were played beautiful by both actresses. My question is on Prisoner. What scene did you find the hardest to film? Uh, yeah, well, I'd say those early scenes, um, the early scenes, my my at my actual arrival at at, at the um, like bursting out of the uh, the thing, I, and I say that because I was because I was very nervous and very unsure of of, of how what I was going to do and how I was going to do it um, and 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 serve the script properly, and so I think they they certainly stand out as the most challenging the most challenging scenes for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one from Patty Barrett. Anna, did producers tell you in advance about Patty's death or did you find out when reading the script? Um, oh, did they, did they tell me? I don't know if I recall if they told me or not. I don't, I don't remember reading the script and going, oh, my God, um, I'm dying, but but maybe but maybe somebody else maybe maybe when I was reading the script, maybe one of the other actors had had already read the script and said, "Oh, wait till you see how you're getting written out," or something something like that. I don't remember the producers telling me. I don't I don't, I don't recall that. So okay. <laughs> Stuart Carey's question we've covered was about other cast members you're in contact with. So we can uh, go to, Kit. well, Kit, we've covered. <laughs> Aaron Turner wants to know whether you smoked in real life. Well, I think we've, we've solved that one. That's if you've just joined us. <laughs> this is my thing to some, you know, and uh, encouraging to others, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. And we, covered, uh, we covered the Telstra lady question from Joseph, so we'll move over to Ken. Oh, well, Bonnie Davis Shacko says, fantastic choice, guys. Anna, I would like to know how hard it was to film your final scene. How many takes did you have to endure? And would you have liked Patty to have had a more positive outcome? <laughs> well, I think we've pretty well covered yeah. that. We've pre we pretty much covered that. Um, I, I recall that we did have to do... I know it was. It, I know it was several takes. I don't know if it was a real lot, but I. But I remember Carol getting more and more like, oh, "Do I have to do it again?" So I. I know we did at least. I. I think there would have been a minimum three or four takes of that. That, like, <clears throat> and and possibly more. Uh, not as many as that first scene with Jane 
just making me laugh. But <laughs> uh, yeah, it was definitely several takes at the least. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Adam Bryan said, what was it like to work with Ruth Cracknell? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, she was fabulously scary to all us kids. I was only 12 at the time and, and she, was, she was a very tall woman as well. And... Um, and very, she, she had the, that patrician facade, you know, the, uh, the uh, very serious face. I, I cannot, when I think of Ruth Cracknell <clears throat> on that, um, working with her on that show, I cannot recall her face smiling. Um, at, at, at the most, I can recall a, a, a slight twitch of the lip. I cannot, <laughs> cannot picture her smiling. It was always serious and kind of glaring at us. That's what I recall. But but she was wonderful to work with. Like we felt uh, on that show, I think the because there were some very like I, I was twelve, which is very young. But there were even younger actors than me um, on the show, and so I think they really like Leonard Teal and Ruth Cracknell and Elizabeth Alexander to some extent as well really kept in character for the kids, um, didn't interact with us uh, a lot as, um, you know, as, as, as themselves. Like, you know, often when you were like working on Prisoner, you know, you'd have, um, you know, this aggressive kind of scene and then it would be like, oh gosh, are you all all right? You know, blah, 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 blah. like we're going into normalness. On Seven Little Australians, they maintained the character. Like, so, so we were always, we were always very obedient to Leonard Teal because he was our strict father and Ruth Cracknell was always, we were just terrified. And so we, we were just always looking scared around her. And uh, I think that, that that was actually Ron, Ron Way's preference and the actors as well to, to, to make it easier for, our, for us children. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And how amazing was she on Mother and Son? I mean, that was just... Oh, <laughs> remarkable actress. Like, I mean, I, I feel... Ex yeah exceptionally honoured to have worked with her on, on, on Seven Little Australians, where, again, she was incredible. She was incredible. She was. And, and it's, a, it's an iconic piece of Australian television. And you know, I'm, I'm very honoured to have had the opportunity to work with her. And at 12 years old, how lucky. Amazing. How lucky am I? Mm. Um, next one is from Simon Zopek. When your character arrived in Prisoner, it almost seemed as if she was set to be the new troublemaker, but then she mellowed. Was this an, an intentional change or did it develop as you portrayed her? I think a combination of the two because they wrote her as, as a claustrophobic. So, so you know, as, as I did mention before, I, I was so nervous about being such a little skinny thing and being so unthreatening and being... <laughs> written as this as this scary threatening character so so I very much clung to the it's because she's claustrophobic she's not really aggressive she's not really she's not really threatening you know she's not she's not really as as bad as all that so I think for me the way I approached it was like it's a sickness and really she's just an ordinary girl who worked in an office and and this terrible thing happened where she assaulted this guy and uh and um you know, ended up in prison and she's actually terrified. So so I think some of that came from me and some of it came from the writing because they also, you know, they wrote me as a claustrophobic. So and they and they let that be um revealed by the by the <coughs> doctor, the psychiatrist. And so that allowed for my character to soften a little. So I think a, a little bit of both there. Yeah. Are you claustrophobic in real life or no, no not really. Not really claustrophobic. Uh, no, I'm fine with small spaces. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've got any real phobias. A bit scared of the dark. Um, don't really like the dark. Can't walk. Can't, I can't walk when it's really dark. I'm too. I always think there's something right in front of me. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think I've got any real phobias. Not especially. No, not oh, claustrophobic. Good. <laughs> um, now Joshua's question we covered, which was about Jane Clifton. So we'll go on to Ken's one. Martin White says, great actress, loved Paddy in Prisoner, and like others mentioned, The Harp in the South and Poor Man's Orange. I'd like to ask Anna's opinion of the lack of locally produced dramas, series, etc., and move to reality TV. 
what was Karen Fairfax like to work with? Um, the chemistry on those shows is wonderful. And he says, thank you. Uh, I'm so thrilled to have that question. And I'm so glad that, that, uh, that uh, he enjoyed um, Half in the South and Poor Man's Orange as much as I did. I love Karen. I consider her my sister. As I've mentioned earlier in this interview, we've only recently reconnected in the last year or so, and she's about to come back to my place to stay for a while. And the chemistry was everything you think it was. We all absolutely loved each other. Gwen Plum was amazing. Martin Sanderson, my dad, they're both gone now. Um, Annie Phelan's gone. My mother, all of us, we all absolutely loved each other. We all loved working on that show. It's some of the work I'm proudest of in, in my career. Was there another part of the question that I've missed there? Um, uh, no, it, I thought... It was, it was just beautiful, beautiful work. The chemi chemistry was as good as you think it was. We, we all truly loved each other. And Gwen Plum was such a joy to work with. Yes. She's so fun. But the foulest mouth you've ever heard. Like, oh, really? It's all when mum swearing and swearing and so she's hilarious. Uh, yeah, yeah, we were, we, were, we were all pretty much swearers on that show, I think, that when <laughs> topped us all, topped us all. And Martin Sanderson, New Zealand actor that was brought over here to uh, to play play uh, Huey and he, he, the dad, and he, he was just incredible. Like, all, all beautiful, beautiful. And Carol Skinner as well, awesome. Yeah. Um, Martin's question also did mention about what do you think about the lack of locally produced drama oh, yes, right. and reality, and reality TV show. I'm oh, curious God. to know what you, your thoughts you, you are. Pro you probably shouldn't have brought that back to me, you know, because that is one of my absolute soapbox topics. I have, I refuse to watch reality TV. I hate it with a all, all reality TV. Every all reality all, TV. Okay. I find it, an, I take it as a personal insult as an actor. I think it's a cheap ass, you know. I'm going to have to smoke another cigarette now. Yeah, like. <laughs> Honestly, like, yes, the lack of the lack of drama, it's because it's too expensive. It's cheap as anything to do reality TV. Yeah. Uh, it, it's like Australia is becoming a cultural wasteland as far as I'm concerned. I think it's disgusting. I, 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 I hate it. I hate reality TV with a deep, deep, deep passion. So, yes. Yeah, Couldn't agree more. I don't approve. I do not approve. You yeah, know what the I, sad I, the sad thing about reality TV now is that they're only casting people that have got big social media following. If you've got two hundred thousand followers, you'll you'll get on. I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here, or yeah, yeah. you know, one of those no, type of shows. I, it doesn't no, even I, matter if you can act or can't act. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I, I am. I feel. I feel. <clears throat> I feel old. I feel. I feel like I, I'm. I'm of another time. You know, like I. I, I don't. I don't appreciate reality TV on any level at all. I just think it's, yeah. I just think it's cut price television and, and, and is an insult to, to the arts uh, and, and certainly an insult to actors. It's certainly an absolute insult to actors. I, 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 I won't watch anything. I will not watch it. The only thing I did used to watch a little bit of was um, uh, I, I could occasionally watch Dancing with the Stars or 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 that other dancing program there was some dancing program years ago that had dancers that they'd choreograph that they i don't remember what it was called but see that featured incredible dancers like talent yeah. people with talent. talent um i mean the andy warhol every minute person will have their 15 minutes of fame quote is is you know reality tv is the absolute um you know answer to to that isn't it like <laughs> yeah all the all the married at first sight so like, you don't have any talent you don't have to be able to do anything you know you just have to be willing to make you know the first time i heard of big brother i i i, I had just traveled to england and my nephew picked us up at the at, at the tra at the airport and he was rushing us home and a, a big brother had just started in england and never heard of it hadn't been in australia yet and he said, oh, I've got to get, get, got to get back to watch Big Brother. It's eviction night. And I said, what? And so he explained the concept of the show. And he said, you know, so all these people, just random people who auditioned for the show or whatever, 
uh, they live in this house and you can watch them on camera 24 hours a day and people watch them all week and it's on telly whatever every night and um then at the end of the week the whole of the population the viewing population get to vote on who they like the least and they get evicted and i listened to the description of this and i said but how on earth do they get people willing to do that like who on earth what what sane normal person would want to be judged by the whole of the population to be told we hate you. Get the hell out of there, you know. It's the two hundred and fifty thousand like dollars at the end of it. <laughs> I, I know, I, I know. But like to me, it was like, is it worth it for only a quarter of a million dollars? Like, is that is it worth it to absolutely publicly humiliate yourself? And he said to me, "Are you kidding? Like they had thousands of people mm. wanting to go there, and like that that was that was my sort of real introduction to the start of reality TV, like real reality TV." And, and I, I, I couldn't comprehend it then, and I still don't comprehend it now. I think it's disgusting, and I think it's one of the main things that is wrong with the world today. Not that I'm opinionated or anything. No, but <laughs> no, I take it you're not a married at first sight fan. Never laid eyes on it. Don't want to know anything about it. <laughs> Lots of my friends will drop something into the car because everybody watches this, this stuff, it seems, you know. And, uh, oh, man, I, I'm, I am rigid about it. I, I, I will not have a frame of it in my vision. I, I, I know nothing. <laughs> Couldn't tell you anything about anybody. Don't want to know. Don't want to know. Um, going back to the question now, Luke, we've already, he asked about working with uh, Leonard Teal, so we've covered that. We'll move over to Ken's. Uh, yes, Jay Shaw says, looking forward to watching this terrific actress, one of the best exits in Prisoner, although I'd love, uh, I'd have loved Paddy to have stayed for longer. But now we know who to blame because Paddy didn't stay longer. So <laughs> there's a lot of other people that wanted Paddy to stay longer. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm thrilled to hear that. That's yeah, there it is. Um, a comment from Brian Lee Whitworth. He said, wow, she looks great. So the promo banner that we had up of you. Yes, I'll, I'll have something to say about that in a moment. Wow, she, wow, she looks great is, is just a statement. That's a comment. Well, of course, my daughter did my makeup for me this morning. I said, you better, because I live in the country now, so I hardly ever put any makeup on. But, <laughs> She gave me a nice subtle makeup, so I'm <laughs> better than I usually do. <laughs> the Nicholas Janidi says, I also loved Anna in Harp in the South. What was it like working with Annie Phelan and Gwen Plum? Well, I think you Come pretty well covered that. I yeah. could go on about it more. Yeah. Idyllic, divine, special. Yeah. Uh, Ollie Middleek said her late mother had a wonderful show on TVS called Joy's World Bless. Yeah, Comment. yeah, she yeah. did. Yeah, she was an eccentric woman and a fabulous character. Yeah, you must check out her funeral video. I sent, I sent you the the link. She to that she so planned you know. her whole funeral. Is that right? I read that she. Unbelievable! The kindest thing, you know, like <laughs> she, she literally had a folder that that told us what to have what to eat at the what the catering oh, wow. for her for her wake um uh you know which church it was going to be at and which minister she wanted and who was going to read what verses and that Anna had to do the eulogy and and uh like we we just had to tick the boxes we didn't have to make any decisions and she'd made this video uh for her funeral to be played at her funeral about, about three years before she died she made it and um it was during the time when I was traveling to Sydney every week and she had her, she filmed her program from her garage. She had this little townhouse in Sydney in botany and she, uh, she turned her garage into a little film studio. And I came home one day and walked into the house and I thought, Oh, I wonder where mum is. And, and I heard this sound in the garage and I went out there and there she is with her lovely friend, Daniel, this gorgeous, gorgeous camp gay guy and he'd done all this beautiful makeup on her and she had she was wearing a halo and she was wearing lots of pearls and feather boas and and, and wings she had wings on and uh and she was making her her, her video 
and uh, it was just hilarious. And 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 you know, you know, it was her funeral. I've never been to a funnier funeral in my. I mean, I was <laughs> devastated to lose my mother, but she was, you know, she was she was ready to go, and she had a wonderful life, as she says in her video. It was the kindest. It was the kindest thing to do. Like like her her video. She she just says, oh, I've had a wonderful life, and I couldn't have done it all with without all of you. And and you know, I've I've been a I've been a mother and I've been a daughter and I've been an actress and I've been a producer and I've been a director and I've been this and I've been that and and uh, and, and anyway it was she had all all the, all the pallbearers my husband my brother Stephen King was one of the pallbearers uh, who played my son in Home and Away uh, and they all had to wear feather boas as they they <laughs> carried around and people followed that 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 coffin out laughing like you never heard so much laughter at a, at a funeral. And the day after the funeral, I was sitting in a cafe having a coffee. It was a rainy day. And I was um, about to catch the train to the airport to go fly back up here. And my mobile phone went. And this voice on the phone says, oh, hello, my name's whatever his name was. And he said, I'm a producer from the project. And um, I heard that, that uh, at your mother's funeral yesterday that, that, that there was um, that, 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 that she'd made a video. And it was really funny. And, and, and then all of a sudden, he stops and he says, Sorry for your loss. <laughs> said, yeah, yeah, okay. what, what, what is it you want? And he said, he said, we'd love to, we, we wanted to know if we could play some of, some of the video on, on the show tonight. And so I said, oh God, she'd love that. You know, she was such a bloody show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and, and he, 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 they literally, I said, well, but I'm about, I'm in the city now, but I'm about to um, go to the train station and fly home. And he said, if we send somebody over there, um, do you have it? Do you have it with you? And I said, well, I've got my laptop. Like they can, download it from my laptop and so they said they said can you wait just like 20 minutes because they were just down at Piermont not far away and like you know half 20 minutes half an hour later this guy comes in and says oh hi and you know plugs into my computer and and that night I, I sent you a little clip of, of yeah. that as well um the of her on the project uh, this little this little clip so she would have been thrilled with that she would have been absolutely delighted so yeah it was it was a pretty amazing funeral people still talk about it when I see them they say oh I still remember your mother's funeral it was hilarious but it was very kind it was very very kind there are some funny stories about a few I read one a few weeks ago about a, a guy in the UK that passed away and he recorded his voice before he left and yeah. uh, it was saying help get me out don't bury me and <laughs> they played this as the coffin was going into the so I, I know it's a bit it's a bit weird, but uh, it was just it was quite a funny story that the the whole all the all his friends were just in hysterics because they knew that that's the type of guy he was playing practical jokes all the time. And yeah, yeah. That's great. I've got a comment from Desley Madge who says, just simply says, looking forward to this gem. Oh, that's nice. Well, I hope it's not disappointing. No, oh, the fans are going to love this. And also from Davy Johnson said, oh, my God, beyond excited about this one, which is sort of a common comment from a lot of other fans as well. We just haven't put them oh, well. Oh, it's so lovely. Like, like honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm really very moved. And these are all real. We, we, Ken, Ken and I have made them up. So. <laughs> it's really very, very lovely. Very lovely. Last one. Last one is from Brian Lee Whit Whitworth. Um, my question is, if you could have played any other character in the show, who would you have liked to have played and why? Oh, oh, let me see. Oh, which character would I like to have played? Well, let me, let me see. Like nowadays, like at the age I am now, uh, I, I would... I always thought, I actually hoped uh, when, when, I remember my agent telling me when Wentworth was being cast, uh, she said, oh, I'm really hoping to get you into Wentworth. Like, that would be so cool. And, and then she said, the first few seasons, I know, I know later on they did actually have some, there have been some actors who were in Prisoner who, who, who have been in yeah. Wentworth. But, uh, but in the early days, they, they, they said, no, no, we don't want any actors who, who were in prison we want all new actors so I, I couldn't uh, be up for any of those but I remember thinking I think I would have been a fabulous governor I think I, I think I would have been a really good governor you got the right voice for it as well 
Yeah, I, I, I just thought I, I, I could have done, I, I could have done the governor justice. I think I, I think I could have, I could have done that very well. Certainly at my age now, I think I would have been a wonderful governor. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was absolutely amazing. Is there anything that you're uh, working on at the moment that we can share with the fans or the fans could oh, look at? We're just uh, enjoying look, life, I'm making good. cheese and scones. <laughs> yeah, I look honestly, I'm, 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 I'm a. I mean, I, I do voiceovers every day. That That's really what I most mostly do these days from my little home studio. But yeah, I think of myself uh, now, now I, I don't think of myself as, as as being retired from the business or anything. Like I, I think I'll always feel like an actress um, <clears throat> just because I've, it's just what I've done all my life, you know, and it's it's, it's what I know. And um, and I can certainly slip, uh, slip back into it. Like if, if somebody offered me some fabulous role tomorrow, uh, I I wouldn't feel like oh gosh how do you do it again um, I I I think I'd 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 embrace it and and love it you know but at the same time I I I'm fortunate and I feel I don't need it uh, like I, I I don't need it to make me feel okay in my life so uh, yeah so if somebody wants to offer me a fabulous role great but if I never get any acting work again. I'm okay with that as well. I, I I feel very satisfied with with my career and um and just doing an interview like this to think that I've worked on a show that was uh that 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 touched so many people and and for such a, a long period of time um, is is extremely satisfying for me and uh, yeah it's it's really truly very touching. I'm very moved by the by the interest of people. So yeah, lovely. Amazing. And uh, we, we thank you for coming on and uh, giving your time to share your memories about your life and stellar career. I mean, what a, what a career. I mean, you've been on just about everything in Australia and uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing that you've been able to. Really, thank you for asking. I'm thrilled to be asked and, and, and have thoroughly enjoyed it. Thoroughly Fantastic. enjoyed it. For, for however long yes. we've been talking. A long time. Two hours, it's all good. Anything you'd like to add before we wrap up, Ken? Uh, two things. Um, one is just a, sh a very brief short story about John Waters, the man with the, the very handsome man with the scar. Um, I was working on a, a television series called The Box and um, we, we get in early in the morning and there was John Waters discovered on a couch playing, strumming his guitar. This was the first time that he'd appeared on the box. And the rest of the cast members followed in, uh, Belinda Giblin, Bryony Behetz, et cetera. And there was a collective sigh sort of went around the, the, the ladies. Yes. Just seeing John Waters just strumming the guitar and looking... <laughs> Like John Waters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Um, the other the other thing that I, I want to say is that from a from a portrait painter or artist, which I dabble in a, a bit, has anybody ever compared you at the moment to Meryl Streep? <laughs> uh, no, no, not at all. The no. cheekbones and the and the smile and um, you know. I, I see a familiar, you know, a familiarity there. Oh, that's that's very flattering. Uh, well, I hope it's flattering. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll dine out on that one for a while, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> I, if I ever get to around to to doing a portrait of you, um, I'd like to do it in Meryl Streep mode. Yeah, please. And Ken, Ken, Ken just said he dabbles. It's more than dabble if you've seen his work. I, I wouldn't say dabble. It, it, it does some pretty amazing. Uh, I'll be able to do this one, of, one of my daughter as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, that was episode 39 of Talking Prisoner. If you can please subscribe to our YouTube channel and like all our social media pages, including Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and all the others. And this episode will be available across all podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio, Amazon, the whole, all of them. 
and also on the talkingprisoner.com website. Thank you so much for being with us, Anna. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me.